So let's just let's just pray. Um, going to be in the next couple minutes. We'll be connected, and uh, we can go from there. Do some testimonies a little bit, and then after that we go straight into it. All right? Hopefully we'll be connected by then. Fair enough, guys. Yes. All right. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you once again for another day you've given us. Uh, I'm real thankful because some of us don't have the opportunity, um, at least not for us, but you know those who had not the opportunity to wake up. Um, so we were grateful, um, and we still are grateful that you give us the opportunity to live again and to get this thing right, this Christian life, this walk right. So, Father, now as we are about to, you know, gauge in, you know, uh, service, we're just asking that all things said and done may be, may be acceptable in thy sight. And Father, we ask that you bless us speak and put words in his mouth that will be meat in due season and that will touch each and every heart. And we're asking that the Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us individually through this time that we spend with you. Um, for any sin, iniquity, transgression that we've committed, Father, we're asking for forgiveness. And we just pray, Father, that again, that heaven would smile in, in regards to what takes place even here tonight. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And, Jay? Yes. No, I just wanted to say that God is good, and um, I'm halfway done with my dissertation. I'm just asking you guys for prayers. In a week? Um, yeah, I'm halfway done. I'm at the midpoint. I, yeah. What kind of dissertation is that? That's yeah. pretty dope. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So hopefully by next week, I can be finished. Praise God, bro. Yeah, so just keep me in prayer. I have two chapters left. Wow, that's dope. Two and a half. Yeah, two and a half. That's dope. Yeah. Congrats. Congrats. Thanks. Okay. I guess, does anybody have any testimonies through the beginning of the week? Oh, look at that. The dark man, Dwayne. Come on now. Yes, sir. Hey. Looking small. <laughs> Looking right. Looking right. Dwayne, good to see you, man? brother. It's good to see you, too. How's everybody? Everybody's good. Good, good, good. So uh, we were just on testimonies. We're just, you know, seeing if anybody had something to share real quick. But we won't keep you too long because we know that, you know, you're a busy, man. Um, anybody else have a testimony real quick and then we'll just let Dwayne do his thing. Anybody? Well, I have a testimony. I'm alive. Um, I've been up for over 28 hours. Well, 29 probably, actually. Um, but I'm still standing. Um, I still got strength. Uh, Work was rough. And you know, you ever had one of those days where it seems like everything that can go wrong goes wrong? You understand? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes, you know, let's be honest. You, you talk to the Lord and say, Lord, what's up? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm, you know, whatever. But, you know, thank God for a relationship because the minute I said that, I was like, Lord, what, like, what's happening here? He said, but I'm allowing you to finish everything that you need to finish, right? right? And I said, you are absolutely right, Lord. You know what? I stand corrected. And I said nothing. And I was able to actually accomplish everything that I was supposed to do for the day. You know I mean, so that's my testimony. You know, despite the fact sometimes we don't know what the day may hold. And sometimes things come out of nowhere, um, literally. But God is still faithful that he allows us to get things done. He still watches over us, still grants us the strength. Um, you probably don't know how I'm standing. I'm standing by God's grace only. So I'm just want to be give thanks to God for that. Um, anybody else before, you know, I'm going to pass it over to Dwayne. No. All right. Okay, cool. So we'll just wait for him to get back on and we can start. I don't know exactly how he wants to do this. So Pastor Evangelist. Yeah, man, hold on, man. We're, we're trying to get a good lighting. Oh, and you too? Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the worst things. I, I never do this right when it comes to Zoom. <laughs> and good so the light, the light should go in front, in of, front you. of you. In front of you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in front of you, yeah. In front of me. Boom, that's uh, it. That better? <laughs> that's much better. OK, great. Great, great, great. Okay, this is about the best everybody will get uh, from me on this one, but I'm not the best at this stuff, but it's good to see everyone. Is that um, better? It looks fantastic. Yeah, that, that's looks, good, everybody? It looks fantastic. That's great. That's good. That's great. Okay, good, good, good. All right, so my understanding is this is the group 
that uh, you all study with on a regular basis. Is that correct? Absolutely. This is the family. Well, part of the family. This is, this is the family, at least part of it. Part of all it. Right. <clears throat> and we're just going to look a little bit into the subject of country living. We're going to see what God has to tell, tell us about it. And uh, we're going to do our best to take it seriously. So let's go ahead and let's begin with a word of prayer. Um, Randy, you said I, I can share a screen, right? Yes, you can. You should be able to. In fact, what I'll do is I will make you a host just so that you don't have no issues. Uh, you got it? Let's see. Yeah, let me just do one thing real quick. Just to make sure I got it right. Okay, then let's go ahead and let's start with a word of prayer, family, and then we'll go ahead and get into our study. Our loving Father, we are very grateful always for the blessing and the privilege to be able to study your words. We thank you always for the gift of life, health, and strength. And we thank you for these opportunities that we have that we can seek your wisdom from above, whom comes from the Father of lights, and that you can make your will known to us in such a time as this in Earth's history. So I just pray, speak to our hearts in a most marked manner and truly grant us your Holy Spirit and open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your law. For we do ask all these things with the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 3. I want to just remind us of a study that the Apostle Peter was doing with the people of God at the time. Devote Jews from all over the world and as Peter was going through the word with them, you'll find that he got to what every sermon is supposed to do, is to make an appeal. A sermon is worthless without an appeal. Don't ever forget that. You always make an appeal. And so Peter is now at a place where the people have been so thoroughly convicted of what has been shared that now Peter's making an appeal and he's showing them what they need to do. And it says in Acts 3 and verse 19, now I want you to watch this when we consider it. Acts 3 and verse 19. It says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send forth Jesus Christ whom before was preached unto you. So I just want you to notice a few steps. The, these are what we call the, the, the prophetic symbolic steps that we see ultimately ushers in the second coming of Jesus. The first step is repentance. After repentance is true conversion. And then from that conversion, it says that your sins may be blotted out, but it also shows the connecting point of how the sins are blotted out. And the connecting points of how the sins were blotted out is it says when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, dealing with the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, no victory over sin without the Holy Spirit. So sins cannot be blotted out of your life or my life if our lives are void of the spirit of the living God. And so now we're at the point that our sins are being blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then it says, and then he shall bring forth Jesus Christ. Now, here's the part that I want us to notice. After this beautiful succession of the Christian experience is broken down by Peter in Acts 3, then it says something else that I want us to consider very carefully, very prayerfully. So it says, continuing, and we're now in Acts 3, and we're looking at uh, specifically verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the time of something. Until the time of what? Restitution. Until the time of restitution of how many things? All things. So don't lose that. God has this incredible plan. His plan is that he wants to restore all things. In the beginning of time, everything was made perfect. And there was no error, there was no flaw, there was no sin. And so when God created in the beginning, it was a beautiful plan, it was a perfect plan. And sin, of course, and Satan messed the whole thing up. Ever since that happened, a degradation of Eden started to take place. You know, what, what originally was the Eden model, it began to die down and die out slowly but surely. And today, the Eden model is barely seen, known, or understood. You know, every home was supposed to be an Eden. Um, all of your homes, my homes, were supposed to be an Eden, okay? Um, there are many lessons that comes 
from the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was a school. It was, you know, it was a hospital. It was a home. It was a church. It was everything. And so when you look at Eden, we have what we would call the Eden model. That's why I would recommend to all of you, if you have never gone through this book, you need to do it like just as soon as you can. And that is the book education. When you go through the book education, you will notice that it begins by opening up the Eden model. That's literally how the book starts. It starts by highlighting Eden and everything God was trying to provide for humanity in Eden. In Eden, you had the best diet, you had the best education, you had the best domestic setup, you had the best everything. And what we see in Acts 3 is that the plan of God is to restore everything back to Eden. Now, we know that an Eden is going to come ultimately when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, we get the full blast of everything, all right? And until Christ comes, we're not. This is why, you know, when we fight against racism, when we fight against police brutality, when we fight against inequality, we are to fight against these things. But we are to understand that these things will not be completely obliterated until the Lord comes. There are some things in this world that is going to remain. Sin is going to remain until the Lord comes. And if sin remains, racism re remains. Inequality remains. Sickness and disease remains. But what does God teach us? He teaches us to do as best as we can to experience as much heaven on earth until heaven and earth finally meet like for real, like, you know, in the ultimate. And this is why in our marriages, our marriages are to reflect Eden, you know, supposed to reflect a little heaven on earth. You go to the average husband and average wife and say, does your home reflect Eden? Do you, you know, you go to, you go to that wife and say, do you look at your husband and do you, do you, can you honestly say he reminds me of the man, Jesus Christ, you know? Can that husband look to his bride and be able to say, my bride reminds me of the faithful church? You know, it's like, these are the kind of questions that we should be able to answer in an absolute affirmative. And what God does is he gives us a pictorial. He allows us to get a snapshot. He lets us see that the more that we can apply Eden in our home, all the principles. Let me give you an example. Like, I, I, I deal with this a lot because I have four adult children and they all live with me still. And the question that sometimes people ask is, when are you moving out? You know, when are you going to leave? When are you going to go ahead and, and do your thing and spread your wings, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to show you the Eden model. So let me give you, let me show you how Eden can, can make so many practical points. So go back to the book of Genesis. If you look at the book of Genesis, when you consider Genesis chapter two, right? I'm just giving you a practical example. Uh, I don't know how many of you on this call um, have children that you have to even be concerned with this right now. You know, your, your children, for, as far as I know, are very, very young. But this, watch what I'm about to show you here. So in Genesis 2, because I always wondered about this. Like, you know, when I was a young man, quote unquote, when I was a legal adult, I was still an immature child in my mind, but I was a legal adult. But um, I remember my mother and father said, we're going to Mullins, South Carolina, like some dead country area in South Carolina. And I'm a straight up New Yorker through and through. So for them to tell me, we're going to some dead country location and I'm very much into New York lifestyle. That was basically like them saying, son, we're going to go to hell. We're going to go die. You know, it was just like, nah, if I go down with you, that's just torture. That's, that's, that's going to kill me. So they said, all right, we're going to cover you for one month and then you're on your own. And I was like, all right. And you know, in, in my ignorance, I'm like, I got this. And you know, and I look back, I can remember times looking under a couch, trying to find quarters, so I can go to Hobbo's Kitchen on Hempstead and, 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 and you know, Queens and, and get a Chinese food dinner and, and try to make it last for two days. You know, it, it was just pathetic. I was a horrible example of a bachelor. But the point is, is that when I look at how young people leave the home and go ahead and live on their own, and then one day I'm looking at Genesis and I want you to see this Eden model. So look at Genesis 2 and we're going to go ahead and pick up on the beautiful story of Adam meeting literally his bride from his side. It says in Genesis 2 and verse 20, it says, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman 
and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, verse 24 hit me like it never did before. It says, therefore shall a man do what? Leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And I thought about that. I said, isn't that interesting? The question is, where was Adam while he was still a single bachelor? And the answer is, he was with his father and mother. And the question is, and how long was he with his father and mother? It was until he found his wife. And so when somebody asked me, according to the Eden model, you know, how long should that youth stay home with mom and dad? The answer is, you stay home with mom and dad until you meet your spouse. Now, we know that there are some exceptions to this rule. If you have special callings in your life, you know, the Lord calls you to another foreign land as a missionary or whatever, then yes, there are exceptions. But the general principle is to be there with father and mother until you meet your spouse. Now, let's deal with practicality on that. Number one, you save money. I mean, think about how many people move out and get apartments or houses just, and then they, they do the worst thing in the world, which is rent. And rent is, is, is horrible because it's, it's literally like people who live for the now. You know, you live for the moment and it's over. It's like that moment, that month, you put that 1,000, 2,000 or whatever, 1,500, and you put it all in there just so that you can secure somebody else's future, the owner, while you are just living, you know, point by point and check by check. Rent is horrible. But nevertheless, that's what most of us do, whether it's because we don't know any better or whether it's because we don't have many options. But the bottom line is often it is money wasted. Number two, uh, how about we magnify temptation times a thousand? When a man has an apartment of his own, when a woman has an apartment of her own, we have just increased the world of temptation a thousand fold to fall into things even like the bed of fornication, okay? These are real issues that happen every single day. And the list just goes on. Now you have no one that is able to be what we'll call an accountability partner. That accountability partner was called mother and father. Sometimes it was brothers and sisters. But when you're on your own and you got your own space and you kind of feel like you're the king of your, your Babylon, now it's like, man, you know what? I can kind of do what I want right now. And sometimes we start doing things with that mindset, which the devil loves to champion in our heads, which is nobody's looking. Nobody's here to, to tell you stop. Nobody's here to tell you turn it down. Go ahead and do what you feel. And so literally, when we move away from our homes and begin living this lifestyle on our own in the name of quote unquote independence, it is very interesting how we fall into some of the devil's greatest pits and greatest traps. But here, when we look at the Eden model, God has said, nope, you shall be with your father and mother until you meet your wife or your husband. And then you go ahead and start your home. And for those youth who have done that, though they be exceedingly and abundantly few, listen to their testimonies. Listen to the young people who said, I stuck it out with my mother and father. I was a helper to my home. My parents helped me in my youth. I'm helping them now, et cetera. And they will give you a beautiful testimony to say, yeah, and, and I'm thankful that I waited until I moved out and now I'm on my own. I know how to budget. I know how to plan. I know how to live. I'm not check by check. I'm not living with debt overwhelming me. I was able to have my dowry set up, met my spouse, got our home, and we are living well. This is the Eden model. And this is just literally one example out of several. But what else do we notice about Eden? Let's go ahead and consider Genesis 2 again, right? When you look in Genesis 2, because God, remember, God wants to restore everything. And he's not going to have everything restored in its fullness in the life we live now. But he's so gracious to us that he allows us to get a snapshot. He allows us to get a picture. He allows us to get just a little bit of, for lack of a better term, we'll call it the appetizer. While we know the second coming brings the entree. It's like what God is doing is he's saying, I want you to experience some of those appetizers right now. I want you to enter into some of the experiences of what the Eden model was designed to be. Now, we can't ignore Eden when we look at Genesis 2, right? The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 8, he just finished making Adam and Eve. Now, he establishes their home. And he says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man 
whom he had formed. This was God's plan. Now, I want you to notice this. When it came to the Eden model, God chose the home. Man didn't. Did you catch that? Don't miss that. The, the, the Bible put those words there on purpose. So it said again in verse eight, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man. I like that. The Bible makes it very clear. God put the man. That brother was understanding that though he's a man, he understood I'm subject to God. Lord, I want you to tell me where I need to be. And God said, thank you for that. I'm going to put you into this garden. And that garden simply represents a place surrounded by the scenes of nature. Okay. In our modern day vernacular, we call this country living. We call this rural living, you know, in our modern day vernacular. But in the Bible times, that's exactly what it was. It was country living. It was rural living. It was living in the surrounding scenes of nature. Watch those words. Surrounding scenes. It's not talking about looking on a porch or looking at a small backyard and seeing a little patch of grass. It was a surrounding of the scenes of nature, all right? And this is what God decided to put Adam and Eve in, in the beginning of time. In fact, if you study the Bible carefully, you go to Genesis four, it was after sin. It was after sin that in Genesis, the fourth chapter, you know, now you can see something different, very different. And you'll see that this is what we call one of the effects of sin. So when you look at Genesis four, we now have the story of, you know, uh, Cain, Abel, Cain, wicked, Abel, righteous. Cain kills his own brother, all right? And when Cain kills his own brother, the Bible says something about it. We're looking now in Genesis 4, and look at what the text says. So in Genesis 4, we're now looking at verse uh, 11. It says, I, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out. So notice he was removed. God drove him out this day from the face of the earth. And from thy face shall I be hid. Now, remember, Cain is being driven from the face of his father, from the face of God, okay? The own, what, what that indicates is the condition of Cain when he left. Don't lose that point. It did not just tell us a happenstance of what happened with Cain's location. It spoke to Cain's condition. Because when Cain was removed, not merely from a place, but he was removed from God's face. Why is the Bible telling us that? It's letting us know that because there's only one thing that will cause a man to be removed from God's face. In Isaiah 59 and verse 2, the Bible says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your gods and your sins have hid his face from you that he would not hear. Meaning when Cain was removed from his location, he was maintaining his sins upon him. He was leaving a sinner separated from God. Now, understanding this, whatever Cain is doing is not based on the mindset of a saint. It's based on the mindset of the sinner. So let's continue to go through the story and let's watch some of the fruit that comes out of that. So it says in verse um, 14, behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from thy face shall I be hid and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. Now notice that. He built a city. So now Cain is choosing where he's going to live and how he's going to live. Complete contrast to what we read in Genesis 2.8. God was the one that was able to build that location of where he lived and plant him there. Cain now in the mindset of sin, separated from God. I'm not trying to do the will of God. In fact, I'm trying to do the opposite of the will of God. So Cain has no interest in the kind of home that he grew up in. Cain wants to establish a whole new way of living. And so the Bible says, and Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. 
Now, this is where I want to go ahead and I'll, I'll draw you to the slide on this because I think these are some good points to consider. When you look up this word uh, city, and tell me if this is not indicative of what we know about cities today, right? A city in the Hebrew was actually um, a place guarded by waking or a watch in the widest sense of even mere, an, an encampment or post. So when you thought about a city dwelling or a city location, according to scripture, it was something that was like an encampment. It was an enclosure. And it was a place that was guarded. There were people that were overseeing over the city and watching over it and guarding the people that lived in it, kind of dictating, telling them how to live, what to do, what not to do, etc. This is kind of the idea of what the Bible was bringing out when the city lifestyle got started. So whenever you think about how did mankind start in country, rural, nature surrounding areas, and eventually moved from that and ended up now into more close quarters, close encampment areas, the Bible makes it very clear that this came as a result of Cain. And this came as a result, of, not of Cain's obedience, but Cain's rebellion. And so city living from its very origin is the fruit of rebellion. It is the fruit of breaking out of God's will, not doing what God wanted, etc. And so when we look at city living, this is where you kind of find its biblical origins as well as when you look at country living, you find its biblical origin. The gospel is designed to bring people as much as it is practical and possible to God's original plan. That is the idea of the times of restitution, restoring everything back to what God wanted. Now, you know, in the country, and, and I'm glad that I'm not speaking about this theoretically, I'm speaking about this practically. This is something that I live. This is something that I've been doing for, you know, well over what, 13 years. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm a New Yorker, you know, it's like, it's, it's kind of nice because I know concrete jungle. I know New York lifestyle. I know what it is to have the little patch and that's all you got of quote unquote land. I understand that lifestyle. I understand seeing bricks, houses, buildings, noise, noise, noise. I mean, I get all of that. And now for me to be able to go to bed at night and it's black. I mean, when you turn the lights off, it's black outside. There's no street light. There's nothing outside of that nature. And it's very, very quiet. The quiet is so quiet, it's loud. It's like, you know, it, it literally, it's like I was able to see both sides of the picture. And so when I look at this, I'm not just speaking from a study standpoint. I'm speaking from my personal experience coming from both sides of the spectrum. And this is why I remember talking to my wife and I said, honey, I said, you know, there's some things that I must say I would not change, even if I found out the whole Bible spirit of prophecy was wrong. And, you know, we, we, we were just talking about it, just kind of vibing with each other a little bit. And one of the things I wouldn't change is my diet. You know, it's like, even if I found out like the whole Bible spirit of prophecy, like, let's, let's just say it was error. And I don't believe that at all. But, you know, I just, even if it was, I said, I would never go back to eating the products of animals. Like, I just wouldn't do it. But the other thing, no question, I would never go back to city living. I would never, it wouldn't be like, oh, this is all Arabs, man, suburbs, here I come. It's like, nope, I would not do that. I would literally stay in the country. I would not, I would not, because I did it all. I lived in urban, I lived in suburban, and I lived in rural country. So I was able to have all three experiences. And so the suburbs is what you call that little middle ground. You know, you think about your Suffolk County, Long Island, you know, you, I mean, you know, you think about certain things of, of that nature, but no, I, I wouldn't go back on it. There are practical benefits that comes with country living. And I just want to talk about that a little bit. When, when we look at, you know, inspiration, it helps us understand that there are many reasons that God wanted his people to leave cities because, you know, Cain's influence has impacted the world far and wide. And people live today in many cities. Obviously, many of you are more than likely living in the city. Um, some of us are living in some serious city areas, like, you know, it might be Brooklyn, it might be certain parts of Queens or what have you. And what God wants us to understand is number one, you're not a sinner because of where you are. So let's make that clear. You know, there's some of us that never even knew these things. In fact, before I go any further, I'd like to clarify this point. Go to John 3. I just want you to look at John, the third chapter. I always like bringing out this point because when we start talking about things that God is not pleased with or is not his will, 
when you start to reveal those things from the word, then what happens is people start experiencing conviction. Now, conviction is not a bad thing, but condemnation is. And so I think it's important to know how to divide that line. So let's go to John 3 and just consider verse 19, right? So when you look at John 3 and verse 19, so I want you to understand that everything we discuss going forward um, is, is so that we can understand what God is trying to communicate to us. So in John 3 and verse 19, the Bible says, this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is how a person is condemned. You're not condemned when you find out that you're doing something wrong or have done something wrong. God doesn't condemn us like that. God is not quick to condemn, but if I'm thankful he's quick to save. But condemnation comes when we find ourselves in a place where we begin to see the light, understand the light, comprehend the light, but we reject the light. You know, we love the darkness rather than the light. That's when God says, okay, now condemnation has come. So when we go over this study, this is not for the purpose of condemnation. This is for the purpose of education, building up, strengthening and edifying, and hopefully encouraging us to give this a real effort because it's the will of God. So when we talk about reasons for leaving the city, right? One is to avoid God's judgments, okay? That, that's a very clear reason why the Lord calls his people to get out of those cities. So let's go to Genesis 19. And uh, let's just take a look at that just so we can understand that, you know, God means what he says, family. And he, he says these things to us, not to hurt us, but to help us. In fact, um, do me a favor. Keep your finger on, John, uh, on Genesis 19. Go to John 15. This is another principle I always enjoy pointing out when we're dealing with reforms. Go to John 15, but keep your finger on Genesis 19. We're going to go back there. But when you look at John 15, this is a uh, contextual to why Christ says no and why he says yes. Uh, obviously, again, parents to young children, we, we are to always make sure that we are communicating to our precious children that the whole purpose of mommy and daddy saying no or the whole purpose of mommy and daddy saying yes is for the same principle we're reading here in John 15. In John 15 and verse 11, right? Look at John 15, 11. It says in John 15, 11, these things, have I spoken unto you that my what? My joy might remain in you and your joy will be full. Everything that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, whether it's from the book of Genesis all the way down to Revelation, we know it's all the testimony of Jesus. Everything that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, it is designed to not only for us to have joy, but how to maintain it. Don't lose that point, to maintain it. If there's one thing that is very interesting for me to see is a lot of present truth seven day Adventists that clearly have no joy. They have no joy in their heart. They, they, they like, again, I always said it, they're like these present truth gangsters. They're these hardcore brothers. It's like they're, they're biblical roughnecks. And I'm like, what is that? That is like, that is ridiculous. And I, and I seriously, I marvel at it. I marvel at it. Brothers don't like to smile. You know, you, you look like you wanna hurt somebody. You, you're supposed to be to bless somebody. What are you doing looking rough on people? What is that? You know, and, and this is the, this is for me, this is some of the remnants of silly hip hop culture, you know, and, and you know, me mugging and all this other garbage. And, and it's like, that stuff needs to go. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Man, show people your teeth, please. Smile, you know, smile. Let the people, give a brother a hug, man. Go ahead and give joyful words. Say something kind, say something nice. You know, it's like, it's really, it's, it's, it's ridiculous how the more we believe truths for this time is the more bitter, angry, resentful, condemnatory, critical, judging, and the list goes on, we become. It's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, that is the clearest testimony. You are lacking the spirit of God because one of the very fruits of the spirit is joy. And so Jesus says, look, when I give you an instruction, I'm giving this to you so that the devil will not steal your joy. That's why he gives the instructions to us. He wants your joy not to just appear. The verse said that your joy may remain. So every time God says, get out of the city into the country, change your diet, change your dress. Why don't you switch up the music you're listening to? 
be careful and guard the avenues of your soul, etc. When God says that, he's saying it because his, his desire is to make us happy. I mean, that, that, some people have a hard time believing that. His desire is actually to make you happy. The Bible speaks often, sometimes it almost seems like the Bible speaks more of him wanting to make us happy than saving us. It's like, it's just amazing how much you see God over and over and over again saying, I want to make you happy. 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 So it's a very strange thing when you meet sad Ventus. It's very strange. It's weird. It's like, what happened to your joy? And a lot of times it's because we're following self-righteousness, which is dry formality and heavy drudgery. Country living is a blessing. And one of the blessings is that God will help us avoid some judgments. So go to Genesis 19. I told you to keep your finger there. In Genesis 19, you'll remember, verses 12 and 13, and the men said unto Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Why? For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Verse 15, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So God makes it very clear. One of the reasons for leaving the cities is because the judgments of God fall where sin is being grossly practiced. And one of the areas where sin is most grossly practiced is in what we call city dwelling, city locations, okay? You're not going to see it as much in the rural areas, even though it's there. But you see it in its most bold format in a lot of these large cities where there's crowds and people who unfortunately are uncouth, unsanctified, unconverted. And as a result of that, a time ultimately comes where God begins to drop judgments. The judgments can fall, come in the form of calamities, you know, natural disasters, earthquakes, of course, tsunamis, uh, conflagrations, tornadoes. And this is what we read on that coming from the pen of inspiration. It says the ungodly cities of our world are to be swept away by the besom of destruction. In the calamities that are now befalling immense buildings and large portions of cities, God is showing us what will come upon the whole earth. He has told us, now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it, the coming of the Son of Man, is near even at the doors. And so we know that, unfortunately, many of God's judgments have fallen, are falling, and will continue to fall on ungodly cities where we find the greatest levels of vileness and wickedness being practiced. But, you know, there's something else that I thought was very powerful is food. When you look at the Great Depression of 1929 and 1930, the rural areas sometimes had certain advantages. Now, it had, it had disadvantages when it came to economics because businesses run much higher in cities than in country locations. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was when it talked about the food. Rural areas had an advantage because while the urban areas were struggling to find money for food, farmers could grow some crops of their own. So one of the benefits of being in the country during um, you know, an economic but also a food crisis is that you can still eat if you're living in country environments. Um, this is a little comment from a gentleman whose grand, great-grandfather uh, lived during the time of the Depression. And he says, my family was fortunate to live on a farm so we could grow our own crops and vegetables and we had animals he they raised pigs for meat we had chicken for our sunday dinner and always had fresh eggs we ate a lot of potatoes grown for on the farm my mom canned a lot of vegetables so we could eat them in the winter months like radishes beans carrots and beets etc so once again we're just seeing that people were farming we know that we wouldn't advocate the consumption of pigs today but we understand that you know the people were able to live off of their land. Also, in the 2008 recession, I thought that this was very interesting. It shows here, Allison Baum of San Antonio, Texas, hopes to save money and eat better by getting her hands dirty. She is joining the swelling ranks of Americans who have started backyard fruit and vegetable gardening, a trend rooted in a desire to cut costs as the recession bites. I want you to notice that again, people were seeing, wow, the more that we're in economic recession is the smarter it is we need to start growing food.
okay? Then you also have, of course, uh, the agricultural impact even of the coronavirus, which we're still dealing with this stuff. It says the coronavirus has focused the world's attention on the woeful lack of ventilators, respiratory masks, and intensive care unit beds available in many countries. But far less attention has been paid to another pandemic-driven shortage lurking over the horizon, and that is food. As trade walls go up and governments panic about preserving their own food sources, the coronavirus threatens to disrupt global supply chains. So literally, what we're seeing is the more that pandemics, the more that economic crisis comes, is the more that we start seeing that food becomes a very serious issue. And whether you're looking at the Great Depression of 1929, whether you're looking at the recession in 2008, and even as you're carefully looking at the problems connected with the coronavirus, we're seeing over and over and over again, food is an issue, access to the food is an issue, and those who had a farm and had land were the ones way ahead of everybody else. This is why another reason for leaving the cities is practical preparation for troublesome times. Let's go to Genesis 6, consider it. In Genesis 6, practical preparation for troublesome times. This is another reason for country living. Practical preparation for troublesome times. Now take a look at this. Um, we're looking at Genesis uh, 6 and verse 21. And then we'll look at Genesis 41, 35 and 36. So in Genesis 6 and verse 21, when God gave the instruction to Noah to build the ark, the Bible says in Genesis 6, 21, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them, for themselves and for the animals. So notice that God was making it very clear, I want you to practically prepare for this crisis you're getting ready to face. I want you to start storing up food. In Genesis 41, take a look here. In Genesis 41, 35 and 36, we see the same principle again. Genesis 41, 35, and 36. And this, of course, is dealing with the years of famine. It says, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. So again, practical instruction, practical uh, preparation for these troublesome times. And this is where we get into the farming. And this is why we're told very clearly, again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. So we see again, God is making very, very clear, I am a practical God. I believe that you need to practically prepare for a crisis that's coming. And this is another reason why God has blessed us with the gift of country living so that we can practically prepare. Another reason for the city is lessons on faith. You remember that it was in... Uh, Romans, that the Apostle Paul says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then it says, but I say, have they not heard? And the answer was, yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. What a lot of people don't realize is that that quote in verse 18 comes from Psalms 19. And so when Paul says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we have to understand that nature is one of the ways that we hear the word of God, and therefore our faith is increased. And this is why it says, have, we, have they not heard? And yes, verily so, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. Remember this? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And then it says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And then it says, their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In other words, Paul was quoting directly from Psalms 19. Part of the way God speaks to us is through nature. And that's the reason why God put man 
in the surrounding scenes of nature. You know, I just came back from a vacation. My family and I was able to get away for a little bit. And I had a very beautiful uh, devotional experience. I was on a dock and all I had was like the sea in front of me. And I remember that, uh, you know, I had tears in my eyes because there was something heavy on my heart. And I was really just talking to the Lord about it. And I was like, Father, I said, I need to hear you speak. And as I asked God to hear me speak, or I asked God to hear him speak, the next thing that came to my mind was look up. And I looked up and there was a rainbow. I mean, the rainbow was just right in front of me. And I mean, we know that that rainbow is God's covenant promise to his people. And, you know, and I was able to look at that. And, you know, how do you not cry at something like that? How do you not respond to that when, when God has chosen to communicate to you very personally? And so when I saw that rainbow, man, I was just like, wow. And God just started reminding me of all the promises that he's made to me. And he's like, I'm a covenant keeping God. That's what that rainbow represents. And so he's reminding me that I'm with you, Dwayne. I know it's hard. I know it's rough, but I'm with you. And so you'll find that nature has so many ways to speak to us, but you got to put yourself in that surrounding. And so these are some of the things that God just makes clear to us that he wants us to understand. God has surrounded us with nature's beautiful scenery to attract and interest the mind. It is his design that we should associate the glories of nature with his character. If we faithfully study the book of nature, we shall find it a fruitful source for contemplating the infinite love and power of God. This is why God wants us to be out of the city into the country. He wants to build your faith. He wants you to be practically prepared for troublesome times. He wants you and I to understand that there are real judgments that's going to fall and he wants us to avoid it. I mean, listen, the coronavirus is knocking the people out, especially in the cities. The protests and people getting hurt and all these things is happening in the cities. We see that a lot of the biggest problems that we're facing in society are happening in very insurmountable ways in cities. And God knew all of this. And this is why he wanted his people not to dwell in them. It's not that we're not going to be in them, but we're not going to dwell in them. We're not going to live in them. Another reason for getting out of the cities is your health, family. It's your health. You know, one of the signs that I remember seeing in Brooklyn, New York, it kind of blew my mind, is I remember being in Brooklyn and it literally said, if you have respiratory problems, it is best to stay inside because the air quality was that poor. And I thought to myself, I was like, wow, you know, if you got COPD or if you have certain heart disease or other, any type of respiratory diseases, it's amazing how in the city, there's so much congestion and all these other things that unfortunately it can actually compromise people's health. I remember when I moved out into um, Monticello, Georgia, it was in Jasper County. And I remember checking on the air quality. And when I checked on the air, air quality, it was 95% pure fresh air. I mean, you could go outside and take a deep breath. And I mean, it was just amazing. We don't understand how much pure air is life giving. We don't understand how much pure air is disease destroying. You know, pure air can destroy many things as well as it can give many things. And so when we think about one of the reasons for country living, it's for our health. You know, nature is our doctor. Take a look. It says the pure air, the glad sunshine, the flowers and trees, the orchards and vineyards and outdoor exercise amid these surroundings are health giving, life giving. Physicians and nurses should, hey Randy, pay close attention to this. Physicians and nurses should encourage their patients to be much in the open air. Outdoor life is the only remedy that many invalids need. It has a wonderful power to heal diseases caused by the excitements and excesses of fashionable life, a life that weakens and destroys the powers of body, mind, and soul. So I just want you to see how being out in the open air is huge. And that's the reason, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I personally believe, because I'm a Christian, and because I believe in the Bible, and because I believe in the laws of health, one of the laws of health is pure, fresh air. The same reason that I do not go into a gym or any type of enclosed area where I'm breathing in the recycled air of people is because that's not health giving, that's not life giving. All right, so now we're in a pandemic. And you know, when we were in this pandemic, I thought it was very interesting. The, the two Bakersfield doctors from California, if any of you watch their videos, 
they made a statement that I don't know if a lot, it'll probably never get pressed on the news, but they made a very powerful statement that I think that many people would find, many scientists, health educators would find it very difficult to disprove. They talked about how the lockdowns especially impacted people in cities. You see, I was on lockdown, but I was in Windsor, Massachusetts, where I'm surrounded by mountains, right? So being on lockdown for me was not lockdown because it was kind of like, man, I needed this break. You know, it's like, good. I don't have to travel and fly anywhere. I'm able to be in the country and just enjoy the scenes of nature. And I was able to do all sorts of stuff on those 80 acres of land. So it wasn't punishing to me. And I spent a lot of time outside. Now, when I think about my brothers and sisters who live in apartments, when I think about people who lived in very, very close quarters in the cities, I thought to myself, I said, this is interesting. People are afraid to go outside. And then they're also kind of threatened. Like if you go outside, you know, there's going to be like ABC problems because at this time there was no mandating of masks. And I thought to myself, how could that be healthy when people are staying indoors like almost all the time? Windows closed because it was cooler months. They're breathing in their own recycled air on a regular basis and the list goes on. So these Bakerfield doctors come out and that's exactly what they said. They said all these people staying in their homes on lockdown, he talked, they talked about how this can be immunosuppressive, like it's gonna weaken their immune systems. And then they said this, and tell me if we're not seeing this right now, they said, watch when the reopens take place. They said, when the reopens take place and people start going out more, notice that their immune systems are gonna be so suppressed, guess what we're gonna see? They said, we're gonna see even higher cases of coronavirus. I'm like, prophecy fulfilled. Because all of a sudden, as we're reopened, now all of a sudden, corona cases are growing out through the roof and nobody's talking about those type of statistics. And here it is that God's word is telling us that when we're out in the open air, it is life-giving and health-giving. These are benefits of being out of the cities in the country. Imagine physicians and nurses should encourage their patients to be much in the open air. Outdoor life is, on, is the only remedy that many invalids need. That's how powerful pure fresh air is and that you get tons of that when you're doing country living. Another point for reason, uh, reasons for leaving the city is of course the prophetic implications, right? When you think about the prophetic implications, we know that Jerusalem, in, in, when Jesus said, we talked about the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, and he talked about the Roman armies. We'll remember that there were two sieges. The first siege was in AD 66 under Cestius. Then, the second siege was the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So Jesus gave this warning. When you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, when you see these Roman armies, it is time to get out of the cities and to get into the country. That was a very clear statement from the Lord. Matthew 24, 14, Luke 21, and eh, pretty much around like verse 13 to verse 22, 21, 22. So when you see that, right? Here it is that, the siege that Jesus foretold came in two phases, not one. First one was AD 66. Second one was AD 70. All right, well, let's take a look at, let's, let's make some application to that. When we look at the pen of inspiration, we know that in 1885, now don't, don't lose the, the point of this quote. 1885, the time is not far distant. This is a future tense statement. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As, in like manner, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then, when we see our nations trying to enforce the Sabbath, it, the papal Sabbath, it says, then it will be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. So once we were to see America try to enforce a Sunday law, the papal Sabbath, that was supposed to be our sign. Now, look at this. Now, remember that date was 1885. Now take a look here. Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Notice the date, 1900. 
something happened between 1885 and 1900 because 1885 take a look again just so we clear on it 1885 you remember it said what the time is not far distant and so it was talking about the future and it made it clear when we see our nation trying to enforce the papal sabbath that's the warning to us it's time to get out by the time you get to 1900 get out of the large cities as fast as possible. And to make it even stronger, she says, the time has come. When as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. The children should be taken into the country. The parents should get a suitable place as their needs will allow. Though the dwelling may be small, yet there should be land in connection with it that may be cultivated. So we have the time is not far distant to get out as fast as possible. The time has come. So the question is, what happened between 1885 and 1903 that would cause a shift in God's testimonies to his people as it relates to country living? And the answer is very simple. The answer is found in the 1888 Blair Bill. This is when Senator Blair was seeking to actually pass. You guys can Google this. I mean, this is super easy accessible information. And you'll see it, Senate Bill number 2983 introduced in the first session of the 15th, uh, 50th Congress Senator H.W. Blair, May 21st, 1888, what was the bill for? To secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest. The man literally wanted to set up a Sunday law. This is what y'all got to teach people. Help them understand that Adventists are not crazy. This, this has already been attempted by our, our nation. In 1888, our nation made an effort to pass a national Sunday law. This is not hard, you know, this is not hard to prove. And so it is that we see, and, and, and keep in mind, notice, it says the first day of the week commonly known as the Lord's Day as a day of rest and to promote its observance as a day of religious worship. I mean, they made it very, very clear. This is what we want. And they brought it to Congress and they wanted it to be a bill that was going to be passed nationally. And so, again, what we would call this is cestius. Remember, two, thing, two attempts, right? 8066, 8070. 8066, this is the first time the United States of America ever tried to pass a Sunday law. And that's why 1885, the time is not far distant. 1888, effort to pass a Sunday law. 1900, get out of the cities as fast as possible. 1903, why? Because the time has come. This is, this is clear math, folks. And so what God is trying to show us as his people is on many levels, he's encouraging us, follow what I'm telling you to do because I want my joy to remain in you and I want your joy to be full and I want you to bring as many people as possible into this glorious experience. You'll remember it was in AD 321. It was Constantine that made a powerful statement as it relates to Sunday laws. Remember, he's the one to establish the first Sunday law. And in AD 31, 321, here's what he said. He said, let all the judges and townspeople and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. So in other words, a Sunday law, this is a Sunday law. Let everybody rest on the venerable day of the sun. But he says, let those who are situated where? In the country freely and at full liberty attend to the business of agriculture because it often happens that no other day is so fit for sowing corn and planting vines lest the critical moment let slip men should lose the commodities granted by heaven literally constantine you know you're talking about a papal persecutor and this man understood you know what those of you in the cities we're sorry for you you got to go ahead and follow everything we tell you to do but those in the country you guys can have a greater freedom. Go ahead and grow your food and sustain yourselves and provide to those of us who need the wonderful commodities that heaven gives through your land. And so you see that those who were living in the country were not going through. You, you, again, remember the, the, uh, remember the Great Depression in 1929? Remember the 2008 recession? You see how the people who were in the country had the greater advantages? This goes way back to 8321, when even Sunday laws were in existence it was those who lived in the country that had greater advantages. And so God understood this and he's trying to put you and I in the best position. The ultimate high purpose of country living is this. 
The ultimate high purpose is this, and don't ever lose this point. The ultimate high purpose is Jesus came to this earth to accomplish the greatest work ever accomplished among men. That work is spelled out beautifully in Matthew 1, 21. And they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's the greatest work ever accomplished among men. He came as God's ambassador to show us how to live so as to secure life's best results. What were the conditions chosen by the infinite father for his son? It was the Galilean hills. This is how Jesus grew up. Jesus grew up in the Galilean hills. He grew up in the country himself. And look at Matthew 21. Look at what it says here. In Matthew 21, in those Galilean hills, you know, the Bible spells something out beautifully. Jesus came to be our example to show us how to live. In Matthew 21 and verse 11, the Bible makes it very clear that the Galilean hills was his home. It says, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus grew up in Galilee. He was brought up in the country. And here it is, we're told in inspiration, a secluded home in the Galilean hills, a household sustained by honest, self-respecting labor, a life of simplicity, daily conflict with difficulty and hardship, self-sacrifice, economy, and patient, gladsome service, the hour of study at his mother's side with the open scroll of scripture, the quiet of dawn or twilight in the green valley, the holy ministries of nature, the study of creation and providence, and the soul's communion with God, these were the conditions and opportunities of the early life of Jesus. You see, when you get into the country, one thing I want you to remember is the message is country living, not country location. When you think about country living, read this paragraph prayerfully and carefully. This was the life of Jesus. This needs to be the life of you. It needs to be the life of me. Yes, your mother, you may not be by your mother's side study, but just about everything else in this quote spells out country living, okay? Honest, self-respecting labor a life of simplicity, daily contact with daily conflict with difficulty and hardship, self-sacrifice, economy, patient, gladsome service, the hour of study. All of that is what makes up this idea called country living. Understanding this, sometimes people say this, and you'll hear this a lot. Um, I've heard pastors say this. I've heard lay people say this. I've heard evangelists say this. They say, um, if we live in the country, what happens to the people in the city? You know, are, are we supposed to leave them all for dead? No. And that's why I said to you earlier that the goal is not to leave the cities, period. The goal is not to live in the cities. So notice, he, which is Enoch, it says he did not make his abode with the wicked. He did not locate in Sodom thinking to save Sodom. He placed himself and his family where the atmosphere would be as pure as possible. And I love this part. It says, after proclaiming his message, he always took back with him to his place of retirement some who had received the warning. Some of these became overcomers and died before the flood came. So please get it out your head if it was ever introduced to your mind that country living is about hiding from people. Country living is not hiding from people because Enoch always brought people back to his home, okay? And we are definitely called to have the Enoch experience and we promise that there are Enochs even today. And so the goal is that country living is not so we can hide from everybody. It is so that we can gain experiences that we can bring with us into the cities when we minister to the people. And then whoever's willing to follow the Lord, we bring them back to our country homes and let them see what heaven really looks like. You see, your home is supposed to be a little heaven on earth. Now, I would caution you bringing people to your house if you and your wife are constantly at odds with each other. If you're constantly fighting each other, if your children are rebellious and rambunctious and, and you know, the home is just in bad shape, then it's not time to bring people to your home yet because there's some issues that need to be resolved. The good news is, is that we're told in inspiration, sometimes when pride and selfishness is removed, five minutes can solve most difficulties. Five minutes. That's early writers, page 119. I mean, think about that. When pride and selfishness is removed, 
in five minutes, we can solve most of our difficulties. So even if you're a husband and wife and you got lots and lots of issues, you know, check your heart for real and ask yourself, Lord, where are my pride points? Remember Proverbs 13 and verse 10. It says only, that's how the verse starts, only by pride comes fighting. When you fight with your wife and when you fight with your husband, when you fight with your children, guaranteed somebody's being proud. Somebody's allowing pride to control them. And as a result of that, your home is not a safe place to invite people to. And you should be bothered about that because our homes were supposed to be places that people can come to and they can learn about Jesus. That's what Enoch did. Enoch always brought people back to his place of retirement. And then those people gained such an experience with the Lord that it says some of these became overcomers and died before the flood even came. That's the impact you're supposed to have on families. That's the impact you're supposed to have on people. Your country home is supposed to have country living lived out so strongly in it that when people come there, they can say, man, your home has something my home doesn't have. They can say, man, a husband that actually loves his wife. Wow. A wife that actually loves her husband. You know, a husband who treats his wife like the delicate flower that she is and the wife who reverences her husband as if he is the man Christ Jesus walking on this earth. I mean, just a mutual love that's being shown one to another. And then parents who love their children and children who love their parents and a family that loves God. One well-ordered, one well-disciplined family will do more on behalf of the gospel than all the sermons that could be preached. Some of you brothers need to stop worrying about preaching so well and you need to start worrying about being a better husband. You need to worry about being a better father. It's like, I'm talking to you for real. You can, devils can preach. You are not a man, you're not a man of God just because you preach well or just because you teach well. You could be a bona fide, stuck up, prideful devil that preaches well. And so God wants you to understand that that's not the mission. Country living is about heaven literally coming down into a home. And this is to be the focus. Amen. I'm looking at y'all. Y'all better say amen. I see you. Amen. amen. That's right. Thank you. Amen, preacher. Come on now. Amen. Come on. Let's go. Now let's, bring it, let's bring it to a close. I want to get Amen. to your, I want to get to your question. So let me bring it to a close. I mean, here's the bottom line, family. We're told in inspiration, serious times are before us. Serious times are before us. And there is great need for families to get out of the cities into the country. Watch this. This is the closing point right here. What is the greatest reason for country living? The highest goal. Serious times are before us. And there's great need for families to get out of the cities into the country. Why? The answer right here. Here we go. That the truth may be carried into the byways as well as the highways of the earth. Much depends upon laying our plans according to the word of the Lord and with persevering energy carrying them out. More depends upon consecrated activity and perseverance than upon genius and book learning. This is what God is trying to teach you and teach me. And so the Lord is just trying to make it very, very clear so that we can understand that the, the great work of God, the great focus of heaven is that God might, you know, bring us into an experience that we can truly experience country living as he designed. And so I just want to leave this with you all to help you understand that th this is the great plan of God. And we need to make sure that God's plan is being fulfilled. Let's go ahead. And, you know, and my hope is this. My hope is that you know, as you have kind of gone through some of these steps, I know you got things to think about. I'm sure you got some things that you need to study. But the key is, is that country living is designed to be a blessing. It's designed to be a solution to many problems that we face right now, as well as what we're getting ready to face in the very, very near future. And so my hope and prayer is that our hearts will be inclined to cooperate with God. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a word of prayer to that end. And then after that, we'll go ahead and go into, you know, some of the, uh, we'll go into, you know, some Q&A and you can let me know what's on your hearts and we can see what, what the Lord is saying. So let's have a word of prayer, okay? Our loving Father, we do thank you for allowing us to learn more about your will for our lives. And you have a plan, Lord. You have a beautiful plan. And we know it's your desire that we would truly be out of the city into the country. Not that we would abandon the precious souls in the cities, but that we can gain an experience with you that allows us to more effectively do ministry in the cities. And so, Lord, I pray, give us willing hearts. And more importantly, show us practically how we can make it happen. 
And we ask all these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this is where we can unmute. We want to go ahead and shoot some questions out. Let's see if the Lord can grant some wisdom so we can know how to answer it. So uh, Randy or whoever's controlling that, let me know how you want to do the Q&A part. So I think we could raise, use the raise yeah. our hand feature. Yep. Um, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. So the only people that can't raise their hand is me and Randy. And of course you, Pastor Dwayne Lemon. Um, so. All right, raise your hands. <laughs> go for it go for it <laughs> well hervey beat me to it so hervey go ahead <laughs> go ahead hey, let me, uh, that, uh, Pastor Dewey, let me, um i have a question because you were speaking about um god placing or providing a place for i guess his children to go into after they are ready to leave right yeah so i was wondering like how do you reconcile that for those who may have come from, I guess, uh, other countries to try to make it here, and the, they don't necessarily have the means to provide that for their children? Yes. How would you reconcile that in the context of what you were you speaking You know, it, it, one of the sad realities is that we as a church um, have forgotten that sometimes we are to be the extension of mothers and fathers to families. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we are to understand that we are a community of believers. So when you got somebody coming from one country to another country and, you know, the parents, I want to make sure I'm understanding you right, you know, the parents are back home and they're not able to lend, I guess, what, support or what have you to the one that's coming from the country over here. You're asking the question, how do you, uh, what, how does that person go about making the decisions for their lives based on God having a place for them? Or that, or more so, the parents themselves, they're able to move to the United States. So, say, for instance, they come from Haiti, and they come right. to the United States, but they don't have necessarily the the wealth, per se, to kind of set okay. their child up to kind of move out. So, how would you reconcile that? In terms well, of one of the things is, is that, like anything else in life, you are to prepare. Um, even Jesus goes to prepare a place for us, right? So, anytime you move from one place to the next, you're supposed to prepare yourself. Mm -hmm. So what you try not to do is make an uninformed move. You know, if you're moving from Haiti coming into the U.S., it shouldn't be uninformed. It should be thoroughly informed. So that way you, 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 your value systems are set in place. Your value systems are going to dictate your, how you manage your money and what kind of decisions you're going to make to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the person's value system from the jump, how much of the word of God do you understand? Uh, do you understand what God requires of you? Do you understand what God requires for your family? And if you don't understand it, then your first step is to get educated before you make that move. Now, this is ideally speaking, right? It, I'm, I'm speaking to an ideal. It, the, 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 I always like to start with ideal and then we go with reality. So ideal tells us, know the will of God first and do not make a move uh, except to be that the will of God can be practiced. Um, there's a statement that, you know, it's kind of like the idea, don't plan your life, don't plan the laws of God around your life, plan your life around the laws God. God. You understand that? So it's like, that should be the ideal way of making a plan to make a relocation, is I must be able to follow through on all the things that God has promised and that God has instructed me to do. And if I don't have those things in place, I'm not going to make the move yet. I'm a weight on the Lord. Ideal. Well, let me listen. And when you're dealing with the reality, you work with what you can. You know, Ephesians 5 and verse 16 says, redeeming the time, not rewinding the time, but redeeming the time, meaning from this day forward, the same way God redeems you at 25 when he wanted to redeem you at five. But, you know, you didn't let it happen at five. So he did it at 25. So he meets you at the time you're at. And from that day forward, you do the right thing. Mm -hmm. in like manner if you've already made the decision you've already made the relocation you've already done the moves then all you can do is redeem the time and say okay lord i now know what your ideal is mm -hmm. i now must learn ways of practical preparation and i must be prepared to go ahead and enter into your ideal the good news is that god has enough grace to meet that need god knows how to meet people after they've made even some wrong decisions, whether it be ignorant, ignorantly or intentionally. And God knows how to help them 
so that they can know how to, you know, go from non-ideal to ideal, certainly by his grace. So that's the only two ways you can look at it. But the key is education and then proper prayerful execution on the education received. That's the only way that you could do it. And a lot of us have been making moves based on feelings, not understanding that our hearts are deceitful. Some mm. of us are making moves based on value. You talk about the Haitian society, right? You know, in the Haitian community, education is king. Mm. But sometimes we will sacrifice education. Sometimes we will sacrifice consecration for education. Mm. You know, and that is something that I said this in many of my Haitian churches and, and they don't like that. You know, they get mad at a brother and I'm like, hold up. Wait, I said, hey, my wife's Haitian. Be nice to me. You know, I'm, I'm part of the family now. But, you know, it doesn't <laughs> help. The, the bottom line is, is that they don't like it. Ah, you, you dumb down. And I don't consider it dumbing down. I just consider it putting it in proper place. We know that what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? So the key is, is that we must get to a precious place that we understand the importance of putting consecration first, Christ first, God's will first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, every other thing comes in. And that is how we'll make less mistakes. Makes sense. Dwayne, uh, yeah. I think there's a question as far as in the chat as well after, after Jason. Yeah, I, I'll tell you the order. So um, Camille had a question, my wife, and then Angela raised her hand, and then ST had the question in the chat. So I guess we could go in that order. Yeah, they that come order. In. that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so you can go first, and I'll go after Camille and then Angela. Oh, I was just gonna. I saw that you have a new YouTube page. Yeah. So I was wondering if your wife is gonna have a platform to help those moms. We need our knowledge. <laughs> I have talked with my wife about this and she has demonstrated her willingness to definitely do some programs. We're gonna be doing some things together where we're actually gonna be talking both about marriage and parenthood. It, we're gonna keep it very real because we're not just gonna talk about our successes. We're gonna talk about our mistakes. We're gonna encourage people to, to understand that this thing is far more serious than we understand. Um, as it relates to what it really means to be a wife, what it really means to be a husband, and then, of course, what it means to be a mother and a father. I mean, you're talking about the most sacred work on planet Earth. So there's no question that programs of that nature is coming. We actually have a studio equipment set up. My son, Caleb, right now is in California getting training. We just spoke with him today, and he's getting training in media work because he's going to be helping us as well as starting his own business. So, um, yeah, you're going to be seeing a lot. We put up new videos every week now, but um, you're going to be seeing a lot of stuff. Once we get back, we have a few missions to go on. Uh, we got to go to Minnesota, then we got to do some work in Colorado. But once we get back from those, which is kind of like the end of August, going into September, that's when you're going to start seeing some of those videos roll out. We're going to start putting those out. So, yes, you will hear some things uh, coming, both from myself and my bride. Jay. Amen. Um, so my question, uh, so Camille and I, we're in the process of um, just securing the house. Uh, we have this um, place that we're considering. It's about 90 minutes from the city, Campbell Hole, New York, five and a half acres of land. So if God says it's for us, everything will just fall through. Um, but God willing, everything goes well. What steps do we need to take, like, as far as equipment that we need? Um, or if you have any recommendations on things that we should read or, or study about, yeah. uh, about like what to do with snow, what to do with what crops to grow, how to cultivate the land. Now, these, I'm these a city boy, questions. grew up in Elmont, 682 Elmont Road, Elmont <laughs> Temple. Um, <laughs> so, <And> he left. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> now, I hear you, man. Um, when it comes to the practical living side of country living because i remember my first tree we uh we we put an hvac system in our home we built a log home and we put an hvac in there you know just want to flip the switch and get heat you know just like that and this guy who put it together forgot to put uh the heat strips in or something like that so i found out that my my bills were very high i mean like my electric bill was through the roof and i was like what is this it was like almost another mortgage so I was like, okay, this is not good. And I called the guy like, look, you, you didn't 
put everything in you were supposed to put in, you got to fix it. And then he ended up saying, uh, well, if I put it in, I'm going to have to charge you. And it was like an additional three to $4,000 above the already three to 4,000 I paid him to put the thing in the first place. So I was like, you know what? I'll call you back. And so I drove past this place where they sold wood burning stoves. And I was like, you know what? We in the country, we might as well go all out. So I, I, I was like, let's look into it. So we bought a wood burning stove. And the, the guy said the wood burning stove will heat like 2,600 square feet. And my house was 2,100. So I was like, okay, this should do it. So I bought it and it was cheaper than paying this guy to do the HVAC. But now I had to chop trees. So you're telling a kid from Queens, New York to chop trees. So I want you to watch my hand. So literally I go down my trail and there's a tree not standing like this, but like this. This is, I'm just letting you see how truly city kid I was. I bought a chainsaw and I bought a good chainsaw. I was really excited about it. Never used a chainsaw in my life, but I bought a chainsaw. And so I'm like, all right, we're going to cut down this tree. So I take the chainsaw and literally I start cutting right here. And so I'm like, Zzz, whatever. Now, do any of you know what's wrong with this? Y'all are really from the city. Isn't that something? <laughs> You're cutting on the wrong side. Cutting on the wrong side, man. Because what ended up happening is as I'm cutting inside and the chain is getting in, all the tree did was go, Toom, and it just landed right on top of my chainsaw. And so my chainsaw got stuck in it. And so I had to figure out a way how to cut it the right way and all this other stuff. So what you're asking is really good because we have to understand some of us are coming straight from the city and we really don't know gardening, chopping wood or any of that stuff. So number one, read the book Country Living. That's number one. I would recommend read the book Country Living. That is by Ellen White. It is a very thin book, very easy to read, and you can go through it and understand it very, very well, okay? Um, that will help you understand what country living is and what some of the principles of country living are about. There's another book called You Can Survive, and that is by Jere Franklin, J-E-R-E, -E, Franklin. You Can Survive. Um, there's a lot of good practical tips in there. Uh, in addition to that, I would definitely recommend an, a, a ministry called Mountain Media yeah. Yeah. Ministry. Mountain Media Ministry is extremely resourceful on those type of questions. So like, I, I didn't know a Husqvarna uh, chainsaw was better than the chainsaw that I got, you know? But he goes into why the Husqvarna is a better quality chainsaw and da 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 da. da. So I was like, oh man, this is good. So on in Mountain Media Ministry, you'll notice it's a website of resources. When it comes to what they teach on the spiritual, even though they're Adventists, I'm just telling you straight up, I can't necessarily agree with every mm. interpretation they have. But that's not why I went to them. I didn't go to them, and I don't direct people to them necessarily for the, the spiritual teachings but I more so go to them because they're very resourceful um, when it comes to best chainsaws to use. If you're gonna do gardening, cool crops versus you know, winter crop versus summer crop and these type of things, they're very resourceful with that. Um, one of the, when I learned how to plant fruit trees, like how the angel showed Ellen White, they had a DVD called Planting That's by the, the Blueprint. That was literally, I took that thing and brought it into my backyard and Oh, the author for You Can Survive is Jer or Jerry, J-E-R-E, -E, Franklin. All right. But yeah, when I, um, you know, bought Planting by the Blueprint, it was like, man, it was like, it, it was, it was literally like planting fruit trees 101. I mean, they, it, they made it so easy. So there's a lot of resources out there like that. When it comes to equipment, solar panels and these type of things, there's an organization, Seventh-day Adventist owned, that's called stovesandmoreonline.com stoves like an oven like stoves stovesandmoreonline.com they uh they promise that no one will beat their price they will give you the best price and you can get everything from solar panels solar batteries you can get wood stoves you can get all sorts of stuff okay uh, hand pumps for your well in the event that you lose electricity during time of trouble i mean they go into all of that okay 
So they have all of that equipment. They're located, I think, in West Virginia. So you can actually go visit them. But the bottom line is, is that there's a lot out there as it relates to resources. So I think that these are very good questions that you're asking, Brother Jason, because you don't want to do what I did. I moved into the country and was like, all right, what do I do now? And, you know, tried to figure it out. Now, with more experience, I do believe it's important for people to really know, okay, how do I use a chain? How do I even cut a tree? I never cut a tree in my life. You know, it's I'm like- still asking that question. And the best news in the world is that you can do it, man. There's videos, there's DVDs, there's YouTube, you know, lectures and, and classes where people show you how to do all this stuff. And I have to admit, um, Dave Westbrook's uh, Country Living University, a lot of people signed up for that thing and learned a ton of stuff. So you might want to look into it. Dave Westbrook, Country Living University. The brothers go, I mean, again, very resourceful. So that way you can get a lot of that practical information. All right. So really excellent questions. All Thank right. you. Oh, All yeah. Right. So Angela. Was, Angela. Angela. And then the question. SC, and then SC Chanel, then Francis over the Peters. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Angela. Thank you for joining us this evening. My question was, what is your counsel for singles as it pertains to country living? Because yeah. you mentioned that you live in the country with your wife and your children, and it sounds beautiful, but the thought of a single person moving out in the middle of nowhere, it feels kind of lonely as well as terrifying. So I wanted to know oh. what are your thoughts on that? Excellent, excellent question. Um, the, what, what, what is recommended is this. It's not that a person cannot live in the country by themselves as a single. It's not that you can't do that, you just may have to be prayerful about it and really consult the Lord as to what exactly are my fears or my concerns? Is it something that I can overcome and do it? Or is it something that's a real obstacle where I need to really consider it? So I'm going to put that out there is at least consult the fear. Lord, why is it that I'm afraid to do this on my own? Because we do have lots of women out there who have lived and, and do live in the country. Um, we have certain individuals who, you know, moved into the country with their husband and their husband died you know, and now they're on their own. And, you know, so there's, there's times where God can show a person how to sustain themselves and be okay, even though they are single uh, living in the country. So I don't want to just throw that out the window, talk to the Lord about that and see what his will would be as it relates to that. But now let's get to some other ideas or some other thoughts. The other thought is, is that you can go with someone. Um, there are lots mm -hmm. of people who purchase land together, or you might, I put a lot of caution on purchasing land together. Um, I'll tell you about that in a second. But you could actually move as a single woman into the country living near other families. That's, that's usually how a lot of single sisters have done it. They will say, I know the Lord wants me to be out of the city into the country, and I am in a position that I can do that, but I'm concerned about being by myself. But hey, you know what? Maybe I can go where there's a few Adventists in the community that maybe there's some degree of relationship with either established relationship or relationship that can be built. But in either case, that is another option, is that if you uh, can get a place on your own, try to live in an environment where there are others around you, other families and things of that nature that you can commune with. If there's things that you need help with that requires a man's strength, you can appropriately get another man involved to help with things that require a man's strength. You know, um, that's an option. The third option is, again, you can move with someone like you and a friend or whatever, buy a property together. But I cannot stress Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? You have to make sure that whoever you would, you would get a property with, that you are on the same page with them. And you need to, at the end of it, even if right now you're on the same page, let's be honest, you have a friend in your life that you are on the same page and today you're not? Probably so. You know, in like manner, that can happen in the purchase of a property. So here's my concern. My concern is, is you and a friend decide to buy uh, 10 acres of land. She gets five, you get five. And, you know, y'all are happy and you're, you're, you're making it happen in the country. And then one day she decides to join with the anti-Trinitarian movement or the 2520 or now she's calling the church Babylon and maybe she's part of the shepherd's rod or some other strange group or whatever. Now what's happening is you're not in agreement anymore. Um, or let's just say, she says, you know what? I decided to go back into the world 
and now she's partying, you know, right near the same property where you are. There's nakedness, there's loud music. Th these are always going to be your dangers of doing it with someone. So you got to just be prayerful and very careful. I would definitely include even prayer and fasting as it relates to getting a property where it can be both of you, uh, two people or more doing it together. You just got to really make sure you're on the same page. We're promised in Desire of Ages, page 668, that the Lord will speak his mysteries to us personally. So God will speak to you personally and let you know if you're making a good move. Even if somebody seems legit, God has these unique ways of saying, don't do it. The same way that somebody might not seem legit and God says, I want you to do it with that person. So that's the good news about having a personal father is that he can talk to you. He can let you know. But these are just different ideas. You can consider going as a single person and trust God and be not afraid. Number two, you can move into an environment where you work with other people, you know, or you're living near other Adventist family. Number three, you can get a property yourself and you can make it happen. Number four is you can, this is a, this is a good intro into country living if your lifestyle allows it. A good intro into country living is if you can move on to a property with a ministry that's in the country already. I know a lot of people who have done that. Their, their first taste of country living was to work with a ministry. Like I know uh, a ministry, uh, as an example, like meat ministry. Meat ministry needs a cook, right? So let's say you were really good at cooking. I would say, okay, if your lifestyle allows it, I would say, why don't you go ahead and do a one-year commitment at Meat Ministry where you go ahead and be a cook there. Um, and of course, it's assuming you can cook well, right? And then you can go ahead and do that. And then what do you get in return? You get a country home. You get to start practicing country living. You get to learn and get acclimated to some things, you know? And then after that one-year commitment, you can decide, am I going to remain? Am I going to move on? Because now you got a taste. you got a little education in there. So there's lots of things you can do. And it's not just meat. It's Wildwood. It's Yuchi Pines. It's Eden Valley, Butler Creek. I mean, there's many places that are already situated in the country, always needs help. And if your lifestyle allows it, you know, you can make certain moves where it can prove to be a great blessing. So those are just like four options that I would at least give you that could be uh, very helpful. All right. Okay. All right, then we got a question from ST. Uh, she writes, there are many testimonies about how individuals moved out to the country, oftentimes sharing that it happened providentially and in a way or place where they weren't looking. How do we find a country property? What role and I guess that's the first question. And I guess secondary or follow-up would be, what role, if any, do we play in trying to find a place? To... Example, savings, realtors, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, listen, stick to the word. You know, people are going to say a lot of things, but stick to the word. The word of God teaches us, seek and you shall find. Um, you know, don't just wait for miracles to happen you know one day you're sitting down it's like oh, the, the lord just told me to go to virginia it's like no don't do it like that god wants you to think 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 ellen white, make, ellen white makes a statement that's powerful she says god gave us brains to use mm. i love that i love that i love that i said man, that's nice i like that god <laughs> gave us brains to use so don't be afraid to use your brain and think a little bit so here's some things number one number one let god's will be done don't start talking that Caribbean stuff. Now, I say this as a brother with Caribbean blood flowing through my veins, but I hear too many of my Caribbean brothers and sisters, I want to go somewhere where it's hot all the time. Mm, wow. I grow fruit trees all year long. I don't want to wow. be. I'm like, stop it, stop it, stop it. You need to let God's will be done. If God wants to send you to Alaska, so. Come on, preacher. Come on. For real, because it's. God's will, God's bill. And if it's God's will, it's good, acceptable, and perfect. So you can't go wrong if it's God's will. So all you need to know is, Lord, what is your will? Where do you want me to go? And then wherever God goes, that's that hymn. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. That's, you got to live that song. It's like, don't just sing it. We sing way too many songs we don't practice. You got to practice what you sing. And so you got to go where God tells you, number one. Number two, God does expect you to be practical. You see, in Luke 14, 
Jesus talks about the importance of counting the cost. And he talks about counting the cost to the point that you need to make sure that you don't start something you can't finish. So you want to make sure that you, like you put here, savings. You got to ask yourself, can I afford this? You can't just be like, the Lord's going to give me that million dollar home. And then you try to buy that million dollar home and you're like, they're like, how are you going to pay for it? I don't know. The Lord's going to take care of it. That's called fanaticism. That is not biblical. You have to have a plan. You got to save money. You have to budget. You have to pay attention to your debt loads. My recommendation is when living in the country, you want to have as little debt as possible. You want to have as little debt as possible, okay? Because country living alters things. Let me give you a picture of the Adventist family. In the Adventist family, I, I say this all the time, especially when I do marriage counseling. I always say this. When I go to the brother, I say, you, so you're going to marry this young lady? Yes. Yes, sir, Brother Lemon. I was like, okay. Um, I'm going to ask them, so what kind of money do you make? Now, now, keep this in mind. I'm done with the spiritual questions. Let, I'm assuming he has already been approved and thumbs up for the spiritual questions. All right. So let's assume spiritually he's all right. But my next question is going to be, where are you at with your money? What kind of money do you make? Can you sustain a home? And the reason why I say this, family, is because brothers and sisters, man, I'm telling you the truth. I know so many couples who got married against my counsel and against other ministers' counsels. And today their homes are wrecks. And it's like, it's, it's bad. And it's just like, man, we don't listen. We're thinking more with our loins. Worse. And we're thinking more of, of our emotionalism. And oh, we're gosh. not thinking rationally that, bro, this is, marriage is serious and it's sacred. You can't just be, you know, going in for the feelings. You got to understand the commitment you're making. It's a covenant. Anyhow, my point is, is that there are people today that I'll say, where's your money at? Are you going to sustain your home? How are you going to sustain your home? Because here's the Adventist family, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. If you really believe in the truth for this time, what that means is that when you get married, one thing that's guaranteed is you're going to have sex, right? You're definitely going to no, do that. I don't know. And that. watch this now, watch. Now, when you have sex, mm. it's going to be a very huge chance sooner or later, somebody's going to get pregnant and it's not going to be the man. And so when the sister gets pregnant, if they're an Adventist home, believers in truth for this time, then that means that the wife, no matter how much of a career woman she was, that wife, if she's following Bible and spirit of prophecy, is going to be that child's first teacher. And two words are going to become a reality called home school. Mm. And what that, now watch what that means practically. What that means practically is that means, hey, husband, guess what? You are now the sole provider. <laughs> You know, you are the man that's going to have to take care of your wife and baby one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or how many children you have. You're going to be the one taking care of all these children. So you need to make sure when getting your country home that you're not just thinking for now, you're thinking for the future. You're thinking for those things that can happen. You got to be able to, you don't want to buy a country home based on you and your wife's salary. That can be dangerous because it's like, okay, so what if your wife gets pregnant? Are you going to pass your baby on to somebody else to get educated, especially a Philistine? Is that what you're going to do? Is that, are you going to put them amongst apostate Israel? Or is that what you're going to do? You got to really think about who are you going to hand your child to? Okay. We protect our bank accounts more than we protect our children. Come on, preacher. And Come that, on. That, that is sin at a high level. And so what God is trying to say is when you get a country home, I'm glad for this question. You have to think about savings. You have to think about budget. You have to think about worst case scenarios. You got to say, man, if we in the worst case scenario, how can we sustain our home? How can we be able to pay for that house? If, if you're not going to buy it cash, how can you practically pay for that mortgage on a regular basis? When it comes to a realtor, get a worker, get a hustler, get somebody who knows how to follow instructions. In other words, you tell them, I need five acres. I need at least two acres of cleared land and I need three acres of wooded land. I need the location to be in a place that is such and such. And such. You need to break that thing down. So you want a realtor that follows instructions well and that has a degree of success. Don't just get the first person that's like, hey, I just started being a realtor. Let me, let me, let me help you find your house. 
I'm not saying say no to them. Mercy. I'm saying be careful with them because I'm all for helping people out. You know, if Randy said, Dwayne, I'm, I'm become a realtor, you know, you and Alex are getting ready to buy a home. Can you give me a shot? I'm going to be like, Randy, you're my boy. Mm-hmm. And so what I would do is I would sit Randy down mm-hmm. and I would say, Randy, um, you know that we're both black and you know, there's some things that's typical in our community. Like mm-hmm. sometimes because I'm a brother, you think you can start slacking on me when it comes to mm-hmm. a job that I ask you to do. Mm-hmm. I want you to not work for me like I'm Dwayne Lemon, your boy. I want you to work for me like I'm that rich, you know, <laughs> whatever guy that you, you, you're about to make the best commission in the world. I mean, I want you to work for me. Colossians 3.23, whatsoever thy hands find to do, do it as unto the Lord. Lord. is like real. I don't mind giving a friend an opportunity, but don't play me. Don't try to use me and get away and skip. If you say, if you say you're going to call me at Tuesday at five o'clock, you better understand I'm going to be bothered if it's 501. You know, it's like, I need to hear from you. If you're going to call me, call me. This is business. You need to take it seriously. So if you have a realtor, just make sure that that realtor is about their business and that they're very good and that they pay attention. If you say, I want a ranch style home and I want it on minimum five acres and I need it to be within an hour to blank city where I work, then if they start selling you, if they start showing you homes with two acres, two story, fire them. I mean, like literally, I'll be like, I'm sorry, you're out. And, and the reason why you're out, you, you, why did you send me a house that I'm not looking for? And seriously, you got realtors like that. They will send you stuff you're not looking for. It's like, why did you do that? I, I was very clear on what I'm looking for. And time is of the essence. Please don't send me things I'm not looking for. So again, I agree 100%. Savings, absolutely. Realtor, find a good one. Um, when it comes to practical preparation, you know, ask questions about the location where you're moving to. There are locations where today... 2020, it's, uh, it's country. 2022, it's suburban. How did that happen? Because you didn't ask the right questions. What's the right question? When you get ready to find a country property, you want to be able to ask questions like, um, how do we know that today this rural location will not one day turn into a suburban or possibly urban area? You start building Walmarts and everything else. You're building apartment complexes. And before you know it, you're going to turn this thing in. Do you, like when my, when my wife and I moved to Monticello, Georgia, they had a committee designed in Monticello, Georgia to make sure the area stays rural. That's the kind of location you want. You want an area where you can check future events. Is there land being purchased? Are they building stadiums nearby? Are they doing this? So, you know, again, it's called research. You get ready to buy a home, family. This is something you kind of really want to do like once, especially in such a time as this in Earth's history. You don't want to be buying homes like you buy cars, you know, every two to five years. It's like, no, you need to get your country home and finish the work. So ask questions, practically prepare, save money, budget, definitely get right players involved that can help you find what you need and pray, 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 pray. And you will find what you need to find. But I appreciate this question. Um, Please don't just look to providence alone. Providence is one of the ways that God speaks, but not the only. So don't just let it be providence. There is practical preparation. All right. Very good question. Amen. All right. So I think the next person we have is Chanel. The question. Hi. Okay. Um, I am currently living in a rural area in Virginia with a family. Okay. And something I've noticed is certain flags hanging around or um, it's, it's different, you know, and I'm, I'm okay, you know, because I've met very friendly people, but um, something that I was discussing with the family was about, you know, slavery returning, you know, certain areas like in the South and, I guess it was more like practical advice when you're looking for property, especially mm-hmm. in an area where there's a, a lot of Confederacy type of um, things going on. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very good question, quite honestly. And you know, the truth of the matter is, is that we are to go into all the world and to give the gospel. We have to give it to bigots as well as to you know, other folks, 
you know, mm -hmm. so even when I'm surrounded in an area where there are bigots, that shouldn't stop me from ministering to people. So the flags in and of themselves doesn't have to necessarily stop you. As it relates to the slave issue or the slave statement, just remember this. In Revelation 13, it talks about the mark of the beast. And, and one of the people that would receive it, it says bond or free. But when you look at that word bond, that deals with slaves. Slavery, slavery will return, but it's not necessarily that it's going to be slavery between black and white. But remember, there's a bigger issue than black and white, and that's class versus class. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, you got the rich class that persecutes the poor class. Uh, the poor class could be Hispanic, white, and black, you know, and the rich class, you know, they can be, you know, black, white, and Hispanic too. So our issue is going to be much bigger than race, even though race is an issue. You know, it's like we do see racism, uh, obviously, in the atmosphere we're in right now. We definitely see racism as a massive issue. But remember, sin is in our world. You're going to come at it in myriad forms. And so what you have to do is ask yourself this question, which is, Lord, in the book Education, page 267, it tells us the specific place that God has appointed us in this life will be determined by, my, by our capabilities. What I want you to do is I want you to look at your capability. Has God given you the capability to know how to break the barriers? Has God given you the skill sets to know how to knock down the walls of partition? If God has given you that, then he definitely placed you where those flags are to do that very work, break down barriers, break down the walls of partition, mm -hmm. meet the people where they are. You know, right now, um, my family and I, we're, we're getting ready to get another property um, because we, we're thinking, we're, see, we're watching God's providence, and thus far, it looks like he's directing us to a different place to, you know, work. And in the interim, we're staying at a location, again, it's rural, but there's a lot of white folks there, and they are Southern, and um, they have different, they, they give many reasons for you to think that they're more than likely bigots. But I will tell you, I remember going in the office and I would go talk to the people there, you know, just about stuff. And, you know, they were straight faced and, you know, all of that looking a little bit like resistant. Boy, I tell you, and especially one lady today when I call and I'm like, hey, this is Dwayne London. She's like, hey, how are you doing? And it's amazing to see how friendly she has become. And, you know, on a Father's Day, the Father's Day that just passed, I just, I went around and I started like saying Happy Father's Day to some of the fathers that, that work there. And just doing that, this guy like came to my wife the day after and was like, you know what? I think I, I want Bible studies from you all. Wow. Like, I'm, I'm like, how did that happen? I mean, he knew we were Christians. But my man said, I want Bible studies from you all. And it happened because this black guy was going around and just wishing him, you know, a happy Father's Day, like genuinely. So sometimes people just have pictures in their head of what a black person is and what they're like. And the television and the media doesn't help, okay. even by black directors. You know, sometimes black directors like making us look like a bunch of monkeys. And so, you know, that's a problem in and of itself. But the reality is that we need to show people, no, nope, we're intelligent, we're loving, we're, we're, we're quite normal, you know? And sometimes they're like, man, I admit, I had prejudices, but you helped me break that. So don't be surprised that if you're gifted in those areas, it may very well be that God planted you. And that's why don't let the, fact, the flags intimidate you. Don't let that dictate whether God called you there or not. Pay attention to your capabilities, your skill sets, your gifts, what God has given to you and the influence that he's given to you in that surrounding area. And God will start opening up to you what his will is. But as far as avoiding slavery, listen, it's going to come everywhere according to the word of God. According to Revelation 13, the mark of the beast issue is going to bring about slaves. And so I'm not seeing an in inspiration that you know, the white man is going to enslave the black man again. That's not what I read in the word of God. But what I do see is that we are going to see this issue of humanity controlling humanity because we're not following the status quo. So, yeah, that's what I see. So don't, don't let that drive you. Let the Lord speak to your heart. He'll tell you what to do. So next would be Francisco and Kimberly. And then after that, there's four questions that were written in the chat. Um, by E C T T L N and so why? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah. All right. So, um, so my question was uh, in terms of 
when I when I listen to different programs on country living, I hear a lot about um, going off the grid. So I wasn't sure if there, when when, and I don't I don't even know if there's a consensus when we speak about country living. Are we talking about being completely divorced from like the uh, the companies that the, company. the electric companies and the water companies and just going off the grid completely, or are there just two? Two paths, um, like one where you 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 have you, you know you pay off electricity and 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 water. Uh, is there also um, something else where you're completely off the grid? So I just I just was unsure about that. No, I appreciate the question. Um, when it comes to you know being on grid or off grid, that is not something that inspiration highlights. Um, that is not something that you see in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. And there are cases where individuals have to use, you know, resources that are available. Um, put it this way, this is not an issue of inspiration, like following God's counsel. Where it can be an issue is being cost effective, you know, saving money. So if you're in a situation where it's like, hey, if you can get off the grid, which means you're either going to do wind turbine, you're going to do generator, you're going to do solar panels, you got to do something. Those are all investments. And some people don't have upfront capital like that because a lot of, again, a big, a big issue that I have is a lot of God's people, we're not business people. You know, we all look, know how to work for somebody. We don't know how to create. We don't, mm. we're, not, we're not, you know, producers. We're just consumers. So that's a crisis in and of itself. But the reality is, is that a lot of us, we don't know um, how to, you know, do things that provides big capital. It's very rare that I meet an Adventist family that's like, we have a lot of capital that we can go ahead and move into our country property. They're usually scraping at the bottom of the bucket. They're, they're like, man, where can I just get a few more dollars just to get approved or, or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. that class of people, you're gonna need electricity from the local power company because you don't have the money and the upfront capital to buy solar panels and do generator hookups and all the other stuff that's required. You're not, you don't have it, it's not even real to you. So again, if you can do it, it's awesome because you're putting money back in your pocket. It's like, that's, that's good budgeting, you know? But being off the grid is not a council. It's not a council from the word of God. God is extremely flexible with that. If you find a country property, but you gotta be on grid, go grab that property. You know, don't dare turn away from that property because it's on the grid, you know, or whatever. Because at the end of the day, like, like, you know, I don't, I, I challenge people all the time. I challenge people, not because I'm combative. I like one of my jobs. I understand as a minister of the gospel is to make people think because people don't do it enough. So if somebody says to me, you have to be off grid, I will usually say, why? And when you ask why, you'll start finding out that they're getting more towards a hiding ministry. Nobody knows where you are. They don't want anybody to know where you are because the electric company, they're gonna know where you are. And this company, they're gonna know where you are, the gas company and so on. And so usually the grid question will lead to various points of fanaticism. But again, I'm telling people in as far as I believe, what I believe is the biblical balance is Hey, if you can be off grid, that is fantastic because you can save money. You can take money you normally would have put to a bill and you could put that towards the gospel. You could put it towards other things. But, you know, no. Is it a biblical mandate? Absolutely not. I've seen no such text. I've seen people try to twist the word, but there's no actual text or scripture or spirit of prophecy that encourages us to be off grid. You know, no, nah, not that. So it's not a denial of faith, obviously, if we go for it. Okay. And that includes having a mortgage. Ellen, listen, Ellen White died with debt. Okay. You know, everybody loves to talk about mercy. God. Ellen, Ellen White died with debt, brother. Auntie Ellen. But, but again, Sister White, Sister White said, look, I'll go into debt about a thousand times over to save Randy. You know, I'm what I'm saying? Lord. that was, that was, that's the concept, man, is sometimes, now again, that doesn't mean just be sloppy with your finances. That, that's not the point. The mm -hmm. point is, is that sometimes debt may be relevant for a work to go forward, you know, and that's okay. So it's not a bad thing if you even go into debt, 
You just need to make sure that you can manage that debt. You got to be able to say, okay, if I'm going to go into debt to buy a country retreat, I need to make sure that I can manage this thing, that I can pay it well, not in best case, but in worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but you know, these are just things that we have to consider. All right, so we got another question from EC uh, from the chat. She write, though it is ideal to stay with your parents, I'm, I'm sure this is in regards to the question, you know, what you spoke oh, yeah. about in regards to parents, right? She said, though it is ideal, oh, this person said, though it is ideal to stay with your parents prior to marriage, what do you do when home with your parents is not eaten? Yes, yes, yes. This, this is sometimes the case, isn't it? Um, you know, sometimes the home itself is not eaten. You know, in situations like that, tough though it may be, do we have any examples in scripture where the parents are ungodly, but the child is consecrated? What do you think? Do we have any examples in scripture where the parents are, they got some problems, but you know, the child is doing all right. Not Josiah, Josiah? Josiah? Who was Josiah's parents? Was Jehida, I think, uh, the priest, was it? His grandmother was Athaliah, right? Athaliah, yeah. His grandmother was Athaliah. His grandmother was, was jacked up, yeah. It was Athaliah, yeah. the wicked queen. Yeah. But, his, but Jehida was the priest. Um, I think that was his caretaker. I, I'm not sure if that was his father. Right. But, but his mother, I, yeah, I know they try to kill off the family member, but I, is, that a, is that a good example? Or I wouldn't use that one, no. Ah, Rebuke. Mm -hmm. Got it. Loved it. All right. In other words, my, my, the point of me asking the question is that you don't really, you don't really see that. Um, you know, there was not one that I could recall where I said, man, where is it? You know, we see, we see unconsecrated children, but I was like, where is it that we see the unconsecrated parents? But while I don't necessarily see the unconsecrated parent, I can see moments where parents have done things that were not after the order of God and how the child had to deal with it. So let's use our primary example, which is Jesus. Mary and Joseph took their eyes off of their savior. They got caught up into their crowd. And they left Jesus on his own. And it was from that, I love how Ellen White puts it, she says that God could not fully trust Mary and Joseph with the care of Jesus. And that's why God had to assign angels to him. And so even when God appointed Mary and Joseph, God was too wise to make a mistake of putting a full trust just in Mary and Joseph. So God appointed angels to protect Jesus. Now, when Jesus obviously comes to Mary and Joseph and they're like, son, we've been looking all over for you. We're in Luke two. That's when Jesus says, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? You know, one of the things that I would say to the young person is remember, your work in saving souls, the, we're told in the book Education, work for souls where the work lies nearest. It doesn't get any nearer than your mother and your father. So if you are converted, but your parents are not, in other words, your home is not Eden, you see that your parents are unconverted, but you are converted, God has definitely assigned you to be an instrument in his hands to win your parents to Christ. And so when your home is not Eden itself, but you are there, you are to do all that you can to bring salvation to your mother and to your father as the consecrated child. You would be no different than Jesus than when Jesus had to remind his parents. You see, when Jesus said to his parents, I hope you caught what Jesus did when he said to Mary and Joseph, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. When Jesus said that to them, this is really what he was saying. Don't you know that I have to be about my father's business because you were not. In other words, Jesus was giving a gentle rebuke to his own mother and father. You were not about your father's business, but I had to continue being about my father's business. That's a lesson for young people, is you gotta be able to show your mother and your father that even when they are veering off from the word of God, you gotta show them, well, I won't. I'm gonna stick with the word of God. You should be doing this and leading me, but I will go ahead and do this and leave you. And so, you know, Mary received that. She didn't have no problem with that. And she was like, wow. And then they went home. And I love how the verse finishes, right? It said, after Jesus gives this, you know, gentle rebuke, after Jesus does that, what does the Bible say next in Luke 2? It says he went home and he was subject to yes, his parents. Unto them, yeah. Isn't that awesome? You know, it's like, 
in other words, Christ didn't go extreme. Jesus didn't say, because y'all messed up, I will never trust you again to lead me in anything. It's like, that was not the attitude of Christ. Christ just saw, he saw the blind spot. He dealt with the blind spot. Mom and dad, I gotta be about my father's business. You weren't, but I have to be. But now that they understood and they say, all right, son, let's go home. He says, yes, mom and dad. And he's now subject to them. You know, he didn't cast some ongoing judgment or anything of that nature. We have to remember these lessons. So again, if your home is not Eden, you may understand that God has called you to his heart, but God wants you to be a light to your mother and to your father. And should it be that a time comes that the Lord has appointed you your work and you have to leave that environment? You know, Abraham had to leave his environment. Parents were unconverted. Abraham eventually became converted, came in contact with the true and living God, and God did what? God pulled him away from his home, didn't he? And sent him on his mission. So it is that God will do the same with you. God will do the same with you. If, you're, if your family and in your home is not Eden, you do what you can, knowing the true and living God, to try to witness to them. But should God call you away from your home because of its un-Eden life, lifestyle, lack of Eden lifestyle, that's all right. God calls you away. You go where God sends you because God has to fit you for his plan. But that's the way you got to work this thing through. All right. So I'll leave it there. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap up the next few questions because we don't want to keep uh, you here all night, Dwayne. Um, no you know, all right. So TT asks a question. She, uh, she asks, can you, well, wow, I don't know if she, well, this person, this individual asks, can you talk, about ways of earning income in the country, how should families approach the need to still provide for themselves when a lot of employment opportunities are limited to cities and suburban areas? You know, that's the awesome question. Um, you know, one of the things that I would like to recommend uh, to strongly consider, there are a few things you can do in the country. So I'm gonna give you some examples. All right, I got one, one friend who uh, he grows, he has probably half an acre if even that, where he grows organic blueberries. And he provides those blueberries to like farmer's markets and different places. He makes $35,000 a year just on his blueberry patch. $35,000 a year just on his blueberry patch. His blueberries are so delicious that both organizations and people, they come, he charges $6 and you take a bucket and you can start picking from those blueberries and fill them up and in that season, that brother brings home $35,000. So number one is produce. You can actually make produce. You can learn how to garden. There's a really awesome organization, um, some good Adventist brethren, uh, Bountiful Blessings. The last name is called Dysingers. And they are Seventh-day Adventists. Um, they've been in the Ministry of Agriculture for years and years and years. There's an annual conference called Ad Agra, Adventist Agriculture, Ad Agra, happens every year. And uh, you can learn about them. You can gain information from them. And what I like about the Dye Singers is their action. They're not talk, they're action. They actually talk about how to, and, and they, you know, it's funny. You go to most schools where they have an agricultural, agriculture class. I have a problem when the agriculture class is teaching you about business and they're not doing business. Because what that means is that it's just theoretical. You know, a lot of these Adventist ministries, they're always talking about business, but they're not running a business and sustaining themselves. That's a problem. So you want people that's doing it, not just talking about it, doing it. When it comes to the Dysingers, they're doing it. They actually show you how to bring stuff you grow from your land into the marketplace and make money. So I really like them. I appreciate them very much. And uh, that is something that you can do. So agriculture is one thing. Clothing. Um, if you, by chance, are interested in sewing and making clothing, one of the things I would highly recommend is consider being a seamstress. There's a lot of money to be made. There's still a whole class of people that like conservative, healthy, 2020-looking clothing. There's a lot of people that are very much into that and they would love to see more conservative clothing. Amen. Um, yeah, seriously. Think about the, the ladies, all the ladies who are on here who believe in dress reform. Look how much drama you got to go through just to find like one dress. Think about how much, how much you got to go through the rack 
to look in clearance and, and to try to find this one skirt or two skirts that look even minutely de decent, there's a whole generation of people out there. There are Muslims, there are Jews, there are uh, various Christian groups. There are some people who are atheists, but they still believe in being modest. There's a whole um, arena out there of people who want conservative clothing. So you can consider making dresses, you can consider making clothing, and you can do that as an industry and you can make lots of money. Um, you can also, of course, have internet service. When you have internet service, that's something I would recommend you try to consider uh, in the country. In Vermont, almost in the entire state, they provide fiber optic network to homes. And I was just like, man, that's good. You know, it's like, that's, that's like the Mercedes Benz of internet, you know, is, is fiber optics. And so today, even in the country, you have cell phones that work, you have fiber optic networks, you have satellite internet. So get internet going there. And then the whole world of internet businesses and internet marketing, all those things become a reality. What we're hoping to do is to put on a, uh, like I have an industry, you know, I, do, I provide merchant services. So merchant services is when an individual, you know, any organization that uses credit cards to accept payment, that's called merchant services. So I provide that to businesses. So I have like doctor's offices, I have restaurants, I have different things where they're using merchant services. Every time somebody swipes a card, I get paid. And so what that does is that allows me to have something called passive income, residual income. So every month, as long as everybody's swiping their cards, I, I continue to have income coming in. So during this coronavirus crisis, I've been very grateful to God because my, my traveling ministry, I've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings and, and you know, Randy has mentioned nothing, family, about giving me an offering. So, you know, that's, that's just how my brother treats me. Mercy, God. Oh, wow. Mercy. Um, it, didn't, it didn't mean we weren't going to give it. <laughs> you know I'm messing with uh, Yeah, I know. But, you know. No, but I mean, you know, and I gladly do this. So, you know, I'm doing these Zoom meetings, da da da. But it's it's not bringing in income like my normal preaching schedule would. But thank the Lord that we had this business, so that way it was able to bring in the residual income. So even if I was in my country home, the income was still coming in because the customers were using the service. So really and truly, the the, the world is out there. It, there's a lot that you can still do. You know, you guys all use WhatsApp. Why didn't you create it? You know, it's like, just think about how many apps today and all these things that are out there. Think about your skills, your talents, your abilities, and start thinking about how can I market this? How can I turn it into something? If you cook well, make a cookbook, provide it in bookstores. People start buying it at wholesale, sell it at retail, and you're making income now. And when they run out of the books, you provide them more. It, 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 I mean, you can do so much. So there's many, many ideas. You may have to think outside of the box, but there's many, many ideas. Carpentry, auto mechanics, you know, uh, plumbing, electrical work. I mean, you can do all these things. Ministry of Healing, page 154. When you get a chance, read it. It talks about the three ways that we can support ourselves. And Ministry of Healing, page 154, she says, some can support themselves through canvassing. That's taking religious material and providing it for a fee. So some of us can support ourselves through canvassing, CDs, DVDs, books, MP4s, MP3s. You can do different things. Then she says, or some handicraft. When you think about a handicraft, again, you're thinking about plumbing, you're thinking about carpentry, you're thinking about those different things you could do with your hands, auto mechanics, et cetera. Then she says, and I love this part, she says, or some other means, meaning it's wide open. You know, it's just wide open. So think about the gifts, the talents you do. And remember the Bible. When God commissioned Moses, remember what God said to Moses. God said, what's in your hands? That's how you start. Start with what you have. And then if you don't have a skill set, then you can learn a skill set. Hey, family, counseling is huge right now. Counseling and coaching is huge right now. With the coronavirus, as a result of people going through mental decline and all these things, so many people right now need counseling and coaching. And there's a, there's a revenue stream in that. These guys get paid $75 to $100 an hour just to do counseling and coaching and more, $150, $175. So again, gain some skill sets, things that doesn't involve you being in school for years and years in debt, but you can take a health coach, life coach, marriage coach training, and some of these things can be completed in like four to six months and you can literally start an industry with it. 
okay? In my opinion, there's no reason for God's people to be broke right now. There, mm. there really isn't. We, we can do a lot. It's just, you know, take your mind out of that one narrow way we've been looking at things and broaden it up, open it up. And no sin, no violation, but be creative, all right? So, yeah, that's what I'll leave you with. All right. All right. Well, I think one of the last questions that we have for the night is by L N. L N. Let's put up a question real quick. It says, what are some safety protocols you take while living in the country? This is so good. I really love your questions. Um, there are some safety protocols. Number one, keep your grass low for two reasons. Um, mow your grass often and keep it low. And I'm talking about where you're gonna walk around a lot and stuff. Like if you got acres and acres and there's obviously a certain part you may not mow it often at all. But where you and your children, your family is basically gonna reside on your property, keep your grass low for two reasons. Number one, snakes. Most uh, country properties you know, are gonna be, you know, it's, it's the animal kingdom's home family. Remember, you're moving on their land. So you trade criminals, but you're going to get animals. So, you know, city, you got criminals. and country, you got animals. So it's like you're going to definitely deal with a lot of animals. So um, keep your grass low because if your grass, you know, there's snakes in the grass. You ever heard that term before, snakes in the grass? It's like that's, that's a very true statement. Um, snakes like to hide. So you want to keep your grass low because it makes it less attractive for snakes to reside there. You don't want your children going outside. And you don't, listen, this is going to be hard too. When you just come out of, out of the city, when your, child, when your child says, mommy, can I go outside? You know, that New York mentality kicks in. You, you ain't going nowhere. But no, hold it, wait. You're in the country now. You should be able to say, sure, go ahead and outside. And let them go outside and let them play in the field. Let them get acquainted with nature. It's a new lifestyle, but they'll love it. And, but again, safety protocol, keep your grass low. Now, the second reason to keep your grass low is ticks. Ticks can really? be a very serious problem. Ticks love to hide or to, to, to stand on the grass. And then when you walk through the grass, the ticks cling to your socks and your skirts or shoe or whatever, and they start to crawl up and they're gonna look for that area where they can bite in. And you know, if it's the tick with the white dot, the deer tick, you know, this is where we get into the whole Lyme disease stuff. So do what wow. you can to try to keep your grass low because that makes it less attractive for ticks. And the ticks will, you know, not necessarily cling to your clothing as much. Um, and that can be dangerous. Um, the second thing to, cons so keep your grass low, that's one. Number two, try to keep the trees, try to keep your house not so close to trees. Um, for a few reasons. Number one, you don't want dead leaves just constantly falling on like your gutters if you have them. Um, that decaying of those dead leaves will create a problem after a while as far as your air quality. But number two is bugs live in the trees. So if you wanna keep your home from not being like terribly infested with bugs, don't have trees just like hanging right over your property or trees just like right next to your property. Like this is the, this is the, this is the siding to your house and there's a tree like right here. It's like you want to kind of have trees at a good distance away so that way bugs don't uh, find your home to be such an attraction, a place of attraction to come and dwell and constantly be in a harassment to you. Um, that's a big one. So definitely keep the trees a, at a good distance from your property. Uh, ever so, folks, I don't care if you buy a million dollar home and, and hear me good. I'm getting to point three. Point number one, keep your grass low. Point number two, Try to have a good distance between the trees and your home. It'll help with bug, just uh, constant bug infiltration. Number three, I don't care if you build a million dollar home, you are often going to see at least one mouse get in your house, okay? Mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. live in the country, mm -hmm. those field mice are gonna find a way to get into your beautiful million dollar mansion. So it does not matter how wonderfully your home is built or whatever, sometimes you're gonna have a field mouse. Now keep in mind, a field mouse can carry fleas, a oh, field no. mouse can have ticks on it. So a tick can get on the field mouse, get in your house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what can you do about that? Again, ever so often, put as many mouse deterrents as you can. What's a mouse deterrent? 
biggest mouse deterrent. If you want to see a mouse free house, and boy, do I know that my mom and dad, I remember that when they bought that country home I told you about, my mom and my dad, if you want a mouse free home, have some outdoor cats. Now notice I didn't say indoor, I say outdoor. Have some outdoor, if you want to have a mouse free house, when those mice find out that you got some felines around, boy, those mice are like, all right, we got to go to another house. We're not going here. And those mice will take off. So that is one protectant that you can do. Otherwise, set up mouse traps ever so often. Check them frequently. And, you know, make sure you don't want a mouse to end up dying on a trap and it's decaying and your house is smelling funny. So, you know, do what you can to set up mouse traps ever so often. Um, you know, so that way, because you're going to get them. I'm just telling you right now, okay, what kind of house you get, you're going to get a field mouse in your house. So just you, be prepared for do that. You have, do you have to feed these cats? Yes, you do. Yeah, of course you do. They're going to run. Come on, man. Come on, Randy. I'm, <laughs> Come I'm on. Saying, you keep them outside and they'll be outside. You the right, go on. No, you have to feed them. You the answer. <laughs> you need to read what the Word of God says about taking care of your beasts. Uh, so you need to take care of your cats, my brother. The only one coming around for one reason, food. <laughs> I'm a work in progress, brother. I'm a work in progress. Cats are not my thing. All right, so we got one last question. Yep. One last question so this brother can go to sleep. Oh, finally. Hold on real quick. Number yes, four is, is bugs. You, you're going to ever so often get some spiders in your house. So, wait, wait, what kind of spiders? Wait, wait, let's, let's be specific. Kind of I mean, a lot of country homes, especially depending on where you live, especially the south, you'll have brown recluses. Oh, no. Um, right. And then... Not really in your house, but around your house, you will have black widows. The best way to avoid this is try to have as little clutter as possible. Spiders like clutter. They like to, to live under boards and live under boxes and live under stuff. The less clutter you have in a home is the less attractive it is both to mice and to spiders. So you do what you can to try to be as clutter free as possible. All right. And so that's just another thing to keep in mind. You know, a lot of these spiders are harmless and I'd like to recommend, please get educated. Get educated on spiders, get educated on snakes, get educated when you move into the country. I almost picked up a red and black, beautiful velvet looking bug. And I was like, oh, this thing is so pretty, man. And cause I never seen it in my life. And I was ready to let that thing run across my hand. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. It was kind of like, don't do it. And so I was just like, you know what? Let me not do it. <laughs> And then I went online and checked it out, and it was a wingless wasp. It was a, it was a species a wingless of wasp, wasp. I've never seen in my life. It was a wasp without wings. And it was this black and red, weird looking, but it was pretty, man, but that thing would have stung me. So you, you need to get educated in your area. Wow. What are the Randy, why you look shook? <laughs> you, you do. I mean, you know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing research right now. Yeah. It, it, looks, it looks dope, though. It does look dope, but. Yeah. So that's, that's the kind of stuff you want to watch out for. You know, just get educated wow. on your environment and that way uh, it'll help. I'll just walk around in a hazmat suit. How about that? No? Hazmat. What about the lake? Lake in your ear? Right, last, last, oh, wait, the, what's that? What? Water, water. Right. water. Oh, oh you're talking about lakes? Are you yes. talking about yeah. yeah, so the, the house we're considering, it has a lake maybe about three acres behind the house or something like that. But anyway, I mean, is, that's it, a... is it sitting water or is it moving water? It's sitting. Mm. Oh, that, that could be a game changer because remember sitting water collects bacteria. Yes. And uh, it'll have lots of mosquitoes. Yeah, and yeah. The, if you, if you, again, man, you buy land so you can enjoy it. You know, you want to be able to sit out on your property and, and have a night out, you know, in the field if you wanted to. If you if at night, man, you're trying to sit down, you got a sitting bed of water, you're going to have so many mosquitoes that, you know, it can create a problem. So talk to them so about that. Just be like, problem. hey, you know, there's some people that dry out the lakes, by the way, depending on how yeah, big. They yeah, this, this lake looks like it's about a football field or two. I think oh. it goes to the neighbor's house. It's not, it's yeah. running. It runs. It's like, we'll, we'll show you pictures. Like, it's, okay, okay, it's pretty. Yeah. But hopefully, if, as long as the water's moving, you're in good shape. It's just that if the water's sitting, it was that, that could be a problem. House. 
Yeah, it was pretty far away from where we were, uh, where the house would be. But I think Camille had one last question. I think no one else. The really, last question, I think the last all of the other questions were were answered. Um, yeah. and and I did have a question about cats. So I mean, I love cats. I don't know if you ever saw my profile picture, but cats oh, are just. Okay. <laughs> um, so the cats would stay outside, or they would come inside and outside. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's probably another discussion when we deal with the health aspects of having indoor cats come on preacher there are definitely some challenges with that at come least on. i'll save it for another conversation come on come on jay yes, Listen to the preacher. so i wanted to know the um the difference between because homeschool is that different than the adventist schools i mean i don't know if that's a dumb question but we there's adventist school with a small population like eight okay. to one, I was just doing research, eight to one per teacher, per student, not like public school per se. So right. what's the difference between, is the advent of school not bad or, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, and also the thing about vac vaccinate, vac vac what are they called? Vaccination. Yeah, that's, that's a big another question. question. Even with the private schools, they're changing that up big time. But um, another thing to consider is what I would recommend is understand there is a little booklet. It's in the pamphlet section of Ellen White's writings. And the booklet's called, What Shall We Teach? That, I want you to really study that out. Because you can build a school curriculum based on what shall we teach. It's literally heaven telling you what the children need to learn. Now, when you read something like that, what you need to do is you need to interview the school. If the school is not following that blueprint, then we have to really think carefully about that school, even to the point of saying that we're not going to send our children there. My wife and I put our children in Adventist schooling for four months and we pulled them out because we just saw like, mm -mm, it's, it, there was way too many problems, way too many problems. So yes, there is a difference between the homeschool and the Adventist school of how it runs today. There is a difference. And so we have to be careful with that. And so I would definitely recommend, look at what shall we teach? Look at what God says. What shall we teach is so specific, it tells you what the child should be learning even within the first six to eight years of their life. I mean, it's like very detail oriented. And so that way you know what to focus on and what not to focus on. And if you find a school that teaches that, well, that's wonderful. But if you don't, well, then that's a problem. And so what you need to do is you need to go ahead and stick with heaven's counsel. Stick with the blueprint, stick with the Eden model. And that's why I told you, one of the books I want to encourage you both to read is Education. You know, read that. Go through the book Education because it'll show you clear as day what you need to be doing, teaching, exemplifying, the whole nine yards. And it'll be a blessing. Amen. And we have come to a close. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. There was oh. one quick question that Herbie had asked. Would this presentation be available? The presentation that you had, is there a way to send it to people? The PowerPoint, I mean. Oh, the PowerPoint? Yeah. What I'll yeah. do is I can put it in um, PDF. I'll shrink it to a PDF. And then, uh, Randy, let me send it to you, and then you can spread, yeah. it, that, spread it out. I, I spread it. Yeah, just give it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. Well, guys, we, we thank you for coming out on a Wednesday evening. We want to thank uh, Dwayne for graciously giving us time. You know, he was traveling and wasn't able to, you know, get it, you know, on time. But, you know, he still graciously came out and spent a lot of time with us. I mean, um, we truly appreciate him. Um, thank you, Dwayne. We, we honestly appreciate it. We love you out here. Um, yeah, man. Much love to you all. And, and I'm glad that we were able to do it. Really, God bl God's blessing to you guys. I hope one day New York opens up in such a way we can see each other again face to face. Yeah. You, you can come to so, Elma. Um, Elma will always love you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my pleasure. My pleasure. If they don't kick him out the door first. But um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Was well, this recorded? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Let me just stop this recording now. Anyway, kidding. Uh, let's let's pray this thing out so this brother can go spend some little time while he has with his family and all of us as well as we can go to sleep. Right. Let's, uh, let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, we just want to thank you once again for the message uh, that your manservant has given to each and every one of us. Uh, I believe this is a message that pricked each and every one of our hearts. And Father, I wouldn't think necessarily wasn't talking about um, country living per se, but about the mindset of the individuals, even before they make that move. One thing he's always told me was that before you can have a reform, you have to be revived. And so, Father, I pray that even as we ponder and we contemplate this move in regards to country living, Father God, that our minds 
will be so connected to you that we can be able to truly leave everything out on the table and sacrifice even everything if needed in order that we may be saved so that when this message is truly given to us, we will not only um, live it to its fullest, but share with others what we know and bring others to the faith as well. So Father, we thank you for your man serving and spending you know, his precious time to teach us and guide us through the principles. And I'm sure we have more questions, Father God, but we do have a Holy Spirit that will lead us and guide us into all truth and lead us to other ministries and individuals that possibly may give us further light in addition to what Dwayne has shared with us. So Father, as we are about to depart from the Zoom meeting, Father, depart not from our presence. We ask for blessings as we sleep and then blessings for the rest of the week until we see each other next time. We thank you once again for what has taken place even now, even on this Wednesday evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, good uh -huh. to you all, family. Y'all be blessed.